Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending. I'm sorry that we spent some extra time in closed session tonight, but we actually got a couple things done that we'll report out at the appropriate time. So that being said, we'd like to open this meeting. It looks like it's about 7.35 on Monday afternoon or Monday evening. Uh, if you could please have a roll call tonight for our attendance. Yes, sir, he's here. I'm yeah. Carrie's here. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. We're missing Mr. Lopez tonight. He had another event, but he sends his well wishes. And if uh, Aiden, would you mind doing the Pledge of Allegiance for us, please? Please rise. Thank you very much. We have two things to report out tonight from closed session. Um, the first item is uh, pursuant to section 6.2 of the superintendent's contract. Uh, we did an evaluation process where we had a mid-year performance evaluation to, uh, with our superintendent. And so we, we fulfilled that part of the superintendent's uh, contract and our obligation to do so. Uh, the second item we'd like to report out is uh, item 2.3, the Glendora Unified Board of Trustees in closed session upon a motion by Reuter, seconded by Garcia, and a vote of four ayes, no noes, has approved the settlement agreement for an OAH case number 202-311-0244, resolving one of our complex matters. There's nothing else to report out from closed session, so we'll move to adoption of the agenda. I move to adopt the agenda as presented. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposition? Okay, so we go to welcome and introductions for tonight. <coughs> welcome. <laughs> I don't think we have... Oh, we have a board recognition for uh, uh, the Glendora Education Foundation for Giving Tuesday. Thank you, President Clifford, members of the board, distinguished guests. It's my honor to invite to the podium our GEF, Glendora Education Foundation leadership, Ms. Prithi Patel, executive director, and co-presidents, Mr. Daniel Boyer and Ms. Melinda Delwishes. They have a special check from their proceeds of Giving Tuesday and all of the wonderful donors in our city and community. Mr. Boyer. Good evening, distinguished uh, board, and thank you guys for having us. First and foremost, as always, I just want to say thank you. Um, we live in such a special place to have a community that supports education as much as they do. Um, Giving Tuesday has been a successful uh, journey over the last couple of years. Special thanks to Brithy and all the work she puts in uh, to this day, but it is absolutely amazing to have a community that can come up and raise over $100,000 in a single day uh, for our students. So we appreciate the community and everything that they do for us. Um, and thank you to all of those who help and work so hard on it. As a special thanks, we do every year uh, thus far have a uh, anonymous donor who matches, and so every dollar donated on that day does get matched. Um, and again, it is uh, exciting to see GUSD spend the money on things that our kids need, and uh, so tonight we would love to um, give you guys some money. <laughs> do you want to go with your number? Um, no, that's okay. 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 Um, just so you know, um, we are excited, again, like Daniel said, that we did have the generous donor that matched dollar for dollar. Um, this year, all schools combined, we raised $101,000, um, and we wanted to present the check to you today. Um, uh, for the, each school had their goals. We had four of the schools that reached their exact amount that they wanted for their items, and some of those items included... Um, outside play equipment to per, uh, those boards or smart boards. Um, a lot of the schools are seems to be getting really excited about that. So we're, we'll be seeing a lot of that in the schools. Um, some the peaceful playground program at Sutherland. Um, so those are just to name a few. Um, I know the high school has a huge goal of um, equipment for their was it their gym, right? The gymnasium. Um, so this year we raised 35000 towards that goal. So that's pretty good. Um, 
But again, we want to thank our community um, and, of course, our generous donor for making Giving Tuesday 2023 a successful campaign. Thank you. Elizabeth, are you the liaison for the... No, Robin is. Robin, do you want to go take a picture with the check, or well, do you want to all, all, all go? $100,000. Okay, well, I'll go. <laughs> Um, I'd like to say one more thing real quick. I do want to thank the community first and foremost because they're the people that gave the money. Um, but I also really want to thank the Glendora Education Foundation for their continued partnership and commitment with our school district, um, the board members um, and staff in particular, uh, for the time that they spend away from their families and their jobs or whatever their additional responsibilities might be to go to back to school nights and to be the liaison at the schools and to work with the principals to figure out what their priorities for um, these fundraisers are going to be. It takes time and effort. And I I appreciate your consistent co consistent contributions and commitment to this community. Thank you very much. I too want to say thank you uh, to the Education Foundation for all of their work and their commitment to our students. I know that it is a community effort, um, you know, because we are raising money from the community and this amazing donor that matches the funds. But the reality is that if we don't have an organization like the foundation that takes the lead on putting that together and the amount of work that it takes. Uh, and many of these positions, most of them actually are volunteers and parents. Um, I volunteered at one point and I know the time commitment that it takes. And so thank you to every single person that volunteers, Prithi, for your leadership. I appreciate everything that you do for the foundation, the way that you represent the foundation out in the community. Um, I'm very proud of it, so thank you for all that you do. Thank you for this money. I, um, I, I made a little video at, because I, I wanted the community to understand uh, just the importance of those funds and what it allows for us to be able to bring to our students. You know, the um, state funding just isn't enough to cover a lot of these fun things that you guys are able to raise funds so that we can do for our students. So as a mom, as a community member, as a board member, I am so grateful for the foundation and looking forward to many more years of partnership. Thank you. It has really taken off. I remember when it first started, one of the one year the goal was twenty six thousand dollars because I was like, I think we should have a marathon and then we could just every thousand every month. So here it is in one time, a hundred one thousand. And of course, it came from the community. And I'd like to thank the anonymous donor that we couldn't do it without without that person and without all of your hard work. So thank you so much. I just want to say, if the anonymous donor ever wants to come out, I'll buy you a cup of coffee <laughs> and high five you. Thank you so much. It means a lot to all of us. Gary, I'm thinking of steak dinner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> your coffee is sorry, good, one more thing. I'm sorry. Uh, the Glendora Education Foundation's Food for Thought event will be coming up on Friday, April the 26th. 19th. I was so close. I even texted you about it just You're last week. Miss it. No, I'm not. Because this week you'll go the week after. Um, oh, I'll just go twice, um, which will be the next uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, that you can send a donation at any time, but um, maybe there'll be an event between now and then. <laughs> but certainly on Friday, Fe uh, April the 19th, we can look forward to the details on Food for Thought coming out soon. Thank you. Thank you, board, for your comments. Uh, the next item is item 3.8, public comment. I have five speaker cards. Everybody gets three minutes. If you don't have a speaker card, I'm not going to call you. So after these five cards, we'll close public comment. So if you want to speak, get a card and, and get it up here so we can, we can do that process, okay? 
The first card I have tonight is Jennifer Kennedy. Okay, well, her ghost must have filled out the card. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Michael Barron. Uh, good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent DeGrazia, and staff. Thank you for once again giving me the opportunity to speak to you. I believe that every member of this board has at one time or another proclaimed their commitment to transparency in campaign speeches and candidate question and answer sessions and in general comments from the dais. Proclaiming belief in transparency has been essentially a unanimously held uh, value. And it's a good thing because parents overwhelmingly want transparency from schools. So I want to share with you a few statistics. In a 2023 Rasmussen Report survey, 84% of California likely voters would support a local law that required parents to be notified of any major change in a child's physical, mental, or emotional or academic performance. Only 12% would oppose a law requiring parental notification. So only 12% of California voters in the survey would oppose parental notification policy. In other findings from the same survey, 91% of individuals polled believe parents, not the government, have the bigger responsibility to raise a child. Makes sense. 88% <clears throat> support parental notification by school officials if their child has a change in mental condition, like showing symptoms of depression or suicidal thoughts. 68% oppose teachers and school administrators keeping information about a child's gender identity secret from the parents. 71% don't believe a minor under 18 is mature enough to make important life decisions on their own. And majorities of every racial, political, and demographic category agree a person should be at least 18 to be mature enough to make important life decisions on their own. How about this one? 57% agree with the statement, a teacher not following a law to notify parents about changes in the student's health should lose their job. These statistics are hard evidence that a parental rights policy, such as the one presented last year to this board, is in keeping with the will of the California voters. Knowing what a family-oriented community Glendora is, I believe that it is safe to say that the same holds true for the Glendora community. One would, could com conclude, therefore, that the three board members who voted against the parental notification policy that was presented acted against the will of the people and supported a personal agenda that does not represent what the majority of parents in Glendora want. So thank you for this opportunity to share with you some additional information. Sarah Barron. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Dr. DeGrazia and staff, and once again, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I have no doubt that legislators and school boards who implement gender identity and sexual orientation education are sincerely concerned about LGBTQ plus student welfare, as all decent human beings ought to be. The historical bullying of this community is appalling, and even worse is the historical callous indifference of some school administrators. I know for a fact that GUSD is not innocent of this phenomenon, but that is another story for another day. But when a correction taken to fix a problem goes so far in excess of the remedy that it turns a society upside down and leads to the bodily mutilation of children, something is drastically wrong. A full indoctrination in gender ideology and the insistence that transgender students be affirmed immediately, universally, and, and at all costs is the minimum price schools and parents now pay to demonstrate tolerance, acceptance, love, and inclusion. It is emotional blackmail. The affirmation of gender-confused kids is proclaimed so essential to their welfare and safety that it justifies trampling on the rights of other students, parents, and school personnel by mandating the speech and beliefs of others. And there we stand. We have a justified destruction of constitutional rights, rights that protect the family unit. 
one of the great fundamental building blocks of a healthy society. The ever-expanding notion of what constitutes bullying or threats to safety is another tip-off that the anti-bullying efforts are really just a pretext for gender, gender ideology education. Actions as minor as wrong pronouns can now, under AB 665, justify the emancipation of a 12-year-old from his parents, and this is without due process. This is all grossly out of reason and supremely destructive to the American family, but that is, after all, the unspoken purpose of this overcorrection to bullying, forced acceptance of transgender ideology. Thank you for hearing. Thank you, Marlene Gomez. Hello. Hello to everyone tonight. Um, my name is Marlene Gomez, and I am the recently appointed CSEA president here at Glendora Unified. And I just wanted to take an, a moment to introduce myself and thank you for your continued support of our classified staff. Um, on the board agenda tonight, um, we have two MOUs regarding our job wage classification study. And I just wanted to thank you uh, for the attention you're giving to these important topics. And um, I'm hopeful that you vote unanimously to approve. And thank you again for your continued support of our school district. Thanks. Wendy Jarvie. Good evening. Uh, I want to start off by thanking Dr. Prince for taking time out to um, meet with me about the ethnic studies curriculum and, um, and just share with me the status and everything that's going on with that, um, with the process. And I was really encouraged that it looks like the district is going in the direction of having a local, uh, locally developed curriculum. Um, I know you've seen myself and Jean Lopez up here many a time asking for the model curriculum to be ignored in, and for the district to favor a locally developed. So uh, it seems like that's the direction that the district is taking. Uh, I recently got an, um, an email from you just letting the whole commi uh, committee for the Community Review of Ethnic Studies to give us all an update, but um, I wonder if it might not be more worthwhile to give an update to the entire community, uh, just for the sake of transparency, to let them know um, what the district is doing. Because um, I know there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes with the teachers developing the curriculum, and if it, they're starting from scratch, like you said, it's it's a lot of work, and I think the community, uh, the community would like to know that that we are developing something that's unique to Glendora. And um, so I encourage you to let the community know the status. Um, I, I realize that we're not having a meeting for a few months, uh, and the teachers are still deep in the research and development. But um, <coughs> regular updates to the entire community would be valuable for the sake of transparency. Um, I know it, it seems like. I'm, it's almost an el elite group to be in the community committee, and I just want uh, the entire community to benefit from knowing what's going on with that process. So thank you. Thank you. I have no further cards tonight, so I'll close uh, the public comment and move on to the next section, which is student board member reports. Mr. Garcia. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start off with Colon Elementary. Uh, Colon has gone the year off to an amazing start. The character trait for this month is preservance, which is perfect word to start off the new year. The teachers and students have been working to identify new goals for this year, and they are feverishly working to get their rooms ready for open house, which will be February 1st. Later this month, the PTA will be providing the students with an assembly that will demonstrate the importance of kindness. This will coincide with the Great Kindness Challenge Week. During this week, we are excited to welcome some high schoolers to our campus as they get to show kindness to the students here at Colon. In addition, the Student Council and PTA will work together to host a family bingo night. We look forward to the opportunity to see students and families together as we partner to help all students succeed. 
Stanton Eagles are leading the way into 2024. Eagle Time, our whole school reading intervention program, continues to be successful as we strive to grow each child's reading levels. Progress reports have been sent out and teachers are working hard to meet child's academic needs. Grades 3 through 5 will be preparing for the upcoming CAPS through Interman Assessment. This week, we look forward to our 5th grade engineering night, which combines all skills to include math, science, and effective communication as families work together to build and create moving projects. It is always an exciting and fun night. We look forward to the Great Kindness Challenge Week and I Heart College Day in February and have many activities planned for each grade level. Sutherland Cougars are off to a strong 2024. At this halfway point in the trimester, our teachers and intervention teachers are looking at student data to ensure that students are making progress towards goals and standards. Later this month, our math intervention teacher will be hosting Math Academy Night to give parents information about our program and provide ways families can support their students at home. Recently, our ICA, Lynn Haddock, and librarian Annie Koyumudian were awarded the Child Advocate Award during a PTA council meeting. They were both recognized for their collaboration in working to motivate our students to improve their reading by reading more and reading various genres of books. We are seeing their positive impact on, these, on the increase in student reading through the AR platform. Sandberg Middle School. New year, fresh start. Students are excited to begin a new semester and have been reminded that everyone starts with a clean slate and equal opportunities to maintain passing grades across content areas. We will continue to offer after-school math tutorials, EL support, and homework club during the week to provide students to any student needing extra help. Student clubs. Students have held club rush during the week of January 8th and will begin meeting this week to share ideas and discuss future agendas and activities. This semester, we have six clubs meeting throughout the week after school and during lunch periods. We are thankful to our teachers and support staff for supporting students by volunteering their time as club advisors. We held our first student think tank in December and are excited to continue meeting with a select groups of student leaders to review school rules, protocols, activities, and events to brainstorm ways we can create a more engaging environment for students. Student voice matters. CAPS is coming soon. Teachers will begin collaborating around best practices for administering CAPS internment assessments and practice tests in an effort to better prepare students for greater success on CAPS summative assignments in the spring. Our goal is to achieve a minimum 5% growth in ELA math and 8th grade science. Glendora High School is excited to bring in the new year and all the action-packed events that are ahead. Before finishing the 2023 year, ASB hosted its cardboard boat race where students and teachers competed for prizes and bragging rights at our own GHS pool. Students were welcome to spectate and cheer on their favorite team while enjoying hot chocolate. It was a great night. Glendora Unified Show Choirs presented the Sounds of Noel for their annual Christmas concert at Glenkirk Church. This was an amazing event by our students who welcomed in the Christmas spirit with their beautiful singing. As finals approached, students had the opportunity to study with their friends and asked for help from teachers at our Coco and Cram. This year was another full event center as students studied and enjoyed hot chocolate and even a surprise visit by Santa Claus himself. Over break, six talented students from Glendora Tartan Band and Pageantry marched in the Pasadena Tournament of Roses Parade with the PCC Honor Band. We are very proud of these amazing and hardworking students. Fast forward to the new year and students were welcomed back to participate in Whiteout Cancer Week. This week is of great importance for GHS as student, staff, and parents help show their support for those affected by cancer. During this week, Tartans were encouraged to wear white to all home games and raised over $700, which will be donated to the Jimmy V Foundation for Cancer Research. We would like to congratulate our girls water polo and both boys and girls basketball, wrestling, and soccer teams for their hard work and dedication to sports and for helping promote the cause of Whiteout Cancer Week. GHS is proud to announce the comeback of our Sadie's Dance. This dance will be on Saturday, February 3rd. Students will come to Sadie's in matching outfits with a group of friends or a date. On the 9th of February is our Spring Assembly, which will be filled with many fun activities and performances. We will introduce the theme of the highly anticipated Action 2024 event. Make sure to stay tuned. Action shirt sales will start the following week. ASB is planning its first Valentine's Day event, a skate night at Skate Express. We will be renting out the whole facility and inviting all students and staff to come roll around the rink with tunes spun by our very own DJ Pete Marquez, a beloved campus safety staff member. That week is also when GHS recognizes Kindness Week, with various activities each day to remind students of the importance of being kind to one another. We will kick off the month on February 5th. During our late start, a team of students will visit each elementary school and welcome students to start their day with kindness. February 23rd will be the Powder Buff Volleyball Game, Junior Boys versus Senior Boys, and to squeeze every last drop out of the month on Leap Day, February 29th, we will be hosting our annual Super Smash Bros. 
Super Smash Brothers tournament in the event center at 6.30 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions about the report? All right, we'll move to the next item, which is comments from the members of the Board of Education. We'll start to my right with Mrs. Garcia. This is going to be weird, but I'm going to yield my time because we started late and we have a lot to cover and there's a lot going on. We, we're probably equal then. Mrs. Berkeley. I'm not yielding my time. <laughs> I only have a couple of things though. Um, I'd like to congratulate Cass, Cash Llewellyn. He has received the Gillendorf Community Coordinating Council Youth Recognition Award this week. Um, no, last week, whenever. Um, I was at the care center, and we have the Glendora Care Center with um, Josie Wilson. She's done such a great job, and I'd like to shout out to um, Faith Community Church. They brought over three car loads, bags of clothes. It was insane, and so we got to hang some of that stuff up. It's going to be such a good resource. It already is such a good resource for the school district, so really appreciate Ms. Wilson's efforts and work in that. Um, and congrats. It's wonderful that faith, you said Faith Church donated everything. If there was, I mean, I, we have a generous community. And if there was a central place that you could start letting people know what it is that you might need, I have a feeling that um, you'll you'll uh, get receive an abundance. But we, other we than that. We do have a space. It's room two at Williams. I know, but, but how do people full. know what's needed? Well, she, um, Ms. Wilson communicated with Faith Community Church. I think, I don't know how they contacted her. But after today... Not, not much is needed. Okay, There's well, no be that point. as it may, please let it be known what you put it on the social medias. Do something and let people know. Thank you. Thank you, board members. And I just have two quick things. One of them is Happy New Year to our Glendora Unified School District family. This is our first meeting. I, you can't say it like after next week, but I still am running into people. That's the first time I've seen them. So Happy New Year to everyone out there. Uh, second thing is that uh, my wife and I, along with other members of the board, attended Bandorama. Um, I don't remember the number, which is bad. 54. 54th. But what a, what a night that is. You get to go there early and have some refreshments and watch the talent that this uh, band, the band and pageantry has. And the room was sold out, believe it or not. Again, it was just every seat was filled except for the blue ones with tape. And some of those were even taken. I thought saw people removing the tape because there were no seats. But yeah, it wasn't me. I promise. <laughs> but it was it was a lovely evening of great local talent, and I'm really appreciative uh, of the parents, the support the community has around that group, and the entertainment that night. It was a lot of fun. So those are my comments for tonight. We will move on to the most important comments of the night from our <laughs> superintendent, Dr. DeGrazia. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board, distinguished guests. I will abbreviate my report somewhat because some of the things have been said, but outstanding job by our students and parents and the boosters for sure uh, in regards to the band, event, the band events and pageantry events all year long. Foundation, our special thanks to you for your commitment and part partnership with Glenora Unified School District and everything that G Giving Tuesday provide or provided or provides into the future, and Mission 17 and 18 in terms of our space projects. A couple of refresher announcements and uh, requests for assistance. Dual language immersion. Uh, we are planning to have that new program at Sutherland in the kindergarten area, uh, grade level, starting next year. We are in need of native Sp Spanish speakers. We have a plenty of, we have a waiting list actually for <laughs> the native English spe speakers to balance the class. But the class, if there are going to be 24 students in the class, 12 should be native English spe speakers and 12 should be native Spanish speakers. We do have a few, so we're on the road, but we need everybody's assistance uh, across the community and communities uh, to fill that class and make it a true dual language immersion class. Our collaboration with the city continues and it is has been enhanced. We are thankful to the city and the Glendora Police Department for securing our additional part-time school resource officer. Her name is Crystal Goins. She is doing field training right now. She will then, after her field training is complete, she will shadow current school resource officer at Glendora High School, uh, Officer Morrison. Uh, our new school resource officer part-time will be housed more than likely at Sandberg Middle School, but will assist with Sandberg, 
Glendora High School on the day that we don't do not have service, and Whitcomb High School, and also uh, our other middle school, Goddard, where where uh, they'll they'll be servicing and pop into our elementaries every now and again. We are, have also rebooted the Glendora Police Department articulation meetings. We will be having one in the month of February and again in April in preparation from the end of the, for the end of the year activities. I'm thankful to Chief Egan for working with us to make that happen. Next Tuesday at the Bidwell Forum at 5 p.m., we will have a joint meeting. It will be the second that I can recall, the second in a year, uh, with the City Council where, where we will be discussing our agreement of joint use, sports facilities, librarian services, crossing guards, school resource officers, all of those types of things, putting them into one document. The document has not been refreshed in some 20 years, and it's taken more than a year to get to the point that it is. We're really close, and we, we're, we're just about to get there. You may have heard the budget news of the, of the, at the state that governor made his proposal for the state budget. Now the battle begins at the legislature to see uh, where things fall. Um, for the most part, he has protected education in terms of protecting programs such as TK, universal meals, free, free meals and lunches and breakfast for all, as well as uh, community partnerships and programs. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. We are hopeful, uh, but we are also very aware, knowing that we have we are in a steep decline. 1,000 students over the past five years decrease, anticipated to decrease some more students next year. We are thankful through business offices' work uh, that the county recently certified positively our first interim budget and our most recent budget, so that is good news. You will hear from our auditor shortly. I think you'll hear more good news in, in, re, in regards to the district finances. And last but not least, to my direct right, your left, first time on the dais, and we congratulate her, Ms. Jeanette Walzak, our new assistant superintendent. <laughs> Jeanette has been with us for more than seven years. Goes fast, right? Um, she started as a director of fiscal services and moved to the role of executive direct director in the last few years. She has some family here this evening that I'd like her to introduce and a few words from you, Jeanette. Yes. yes. Thank you, Dr. Pizza. Sure. Good evening, esteemed board members, executive cabinets, colleagues, and community members. First of all, I would like to express my sincerest gratitude to our board members, Dr. DeGracia and executive cabinet. It is both an honor and a privilege to serve as the assistant superintendent. <laughs> Excuse me. services. I started here at Glendora seven years ago um, in the capacity of Director of Fiscal Services and later on being promoted as Executive Director. Prior to GUSD, I worked at various CPA firms for about 18 years. I was a senior manager. Um, I did audits, um, reviews of financial statements in various industries such as school districts, not-for-profits, distribution, manufacturing, and personal service um, corporations. The last seven years here have been nothing short of amazing. I have had the opportunity to work with our wonderful board members and our amazing staff, both, both certificated and classified. This is a dream come true to be able to work in our community and our hometown that I love and where my um, seventh grade is a recipient of the outstanding education our district offers. I would like to extend my appreciation to all the support from everyone across the district who cheered me on and rooted for me, especially to the business services team who are here this evening to support me. I appreciate you all so much. I'm just so humbled by the support, like I said, by everyone from 
teachers, administration, classified support. I'm truly blessed. Thank you for believing in me and trusting in me to carry out the responsibilities that come with being the chief business official for our district. And lastly, to my family who couldn't be here, my parents who supported me and instilled in me since I can remember to work hard, do my best, be kind, and be respectful. And last but certainly not the least, to my amazing husband, Kyle, and my daughter, Ella, who are the constant cheerleaders with everything I do. It wouldn't be possible without you. Thank you all, and I love you. That's a little harder than the Sorry. first interim report, right? <laughs> Job well done. You can see why she was selected. Mr. President, comments from the board, and perhaps a picture at the end. I think she said it all. I just want to know where that fabulous, well-behaved dog you have is tonight that I saw at the park on the weekend. He was going to come, but he would have cried. Um, I just want the public to know that this was not an easy feat. This was a very... Um, well advertised uh, position. There, there were a lot. There was a lot of interest in it, and uh, and our internal candidate had to compete with people that currently had this job and others that wanted this job. And if it was a horse race, you could she finished by a few lengths. It was she uh, she just hit it running and really outperformed the candidates that were here and was the absolute best pick, not only in our hearts. But academically and socially, she rose to the top during this process, which I think is important to note. It was an outstanding process, and um, I'm very, very proud that an internal candidate of our district was able to rise to the top. But it wasn't easy, was it? There you go. That's all I have to say. Um, if I might, I was not at the meeting in December to be able to vote in affirmation of Jeanette's um, position here, um, but I've known Jeanette for maybe 10 years, no, seven, since you've been here, um, when I was with the Ed Foundation and trying to figure out where which money was from which school and trying to get that all sorted out, and um, Jeanette has always been a, um, a, a pleasure to work with and has always instilled confidence in me when I've been trying to figure things out or not understand something. Um, I'm, I'm not an accountant. I don't understand all of that, but um, the, um, thorough, the thorough way that you explain things and the knowledge that you have, the depth in your um, area, like I said, instills a lot of confidence. So um, congratulations. Happy to have you. Thanks for making me cry. <laughs> I am an empath, so all I have to see is one tear come down, and it's just like, stop it. Um, congratulations. Very well deserved. I am, as a new board member, your ability to get up there and present these very complicated budgets to us in a way that I could understand it from the get-go, because you really have been an amazing, amazing resource for me um, when I you know, when I ask you questions, you're always so kind and, and, and you're very good at explaining it. Something that, again, is very complicated. I mean, when I first, my first budget report here, I wanted to cry like you did. But then you, you, you have a way of bringing a sense of calm and understanding like, okay, yes, it's big, but we're going to break it down and make it understandable. So thank you for doing that for this, you know, new board member. I shouldn't say new anymore. It's been a year, but you know what I mean. Um, so thank you for all that you do. Um, I have faith that you are going to continue to look out for our money and our district and be responsible in that way. Um, you mentioned something that your mom uh, instilled, work hard, be kind. All those things that you mentioned, I see them in you, and I would have, I would have described you with those things as well. So good job to your mom, and good, good job for you to kind of live those things that she um, instilled in you. So thank you for being part of this team. I'm just going to say congratulations. I just, I really enjoy working with you and welcome to the dais. Anything else? Thank you. 
Okay, the next item is item 4-4, a discussion and action of a resolution presented by Dr. Dominic DeGrazia. A very special recognition, Dominic. I'll turn it over to you. Yes, it is special because the month of January is designated as School Board Recognition Month, and it is time that we recognize our Glendora Unified Board of Trustees. I will not read the entire resolution in the interest of time. I know you were all looking Thank forward you. to that. But I will read a key uh, couple of the whereases and then finish with the now therefore paragraph down at the bottom. Uh, to begin, whereas an excellent public education system is vital to the quality of life for all California <laughs> citizens and communities. And Glen whereas Glendora Unified School District Board of Education continues to act to ensure our children's academic, social, emotional, Physical and mental health needs are met at a time when students needed consistent services most. And whereas GSD Board of Education members continue to advocate to best serve the children in our community each and every day. Skipping to the bottom. Now, therefore, I, Dominic DeGrazia, do here, hereby declare my appreciation to the members of the Glendora Unified School District Board of Education and proclaim the month of January 2024 as School Board Recognition Month in the Glendora Unified School District, I urge all community members and staff to join me in recognizing the dedication and hard work of our local school board members and in working with them to create an education system that meets, meets the needs of our children. Please join me in recognizing and congratulating each of our trustees present and unable to be here. We thank Mr. Lopez for his work as well. Thank them for their hard work, their dedication, their commitment to the district and this community. Um, they're passionate about what they do, and they spend a lot of time doing it. So we appreciate their work. Join me in congratulations to the board. We also thank Sandberg Middle School for the poster up on the wall and some of the uh, gifts. We also uh, presented uh, to each of the trustees a plant um, for them to take home. Sandberg, Sandberg with the swag, yes, for sure. Very nice, very nice. Again, thank you, board. Thank you. Moving right along to the next item, the first of three staff presentations tonight. The first one is the uh, annual district audit report presented by Jeanette Walzak, our assistant superintendent of business services, also known as chief business official. And Christy White of Christy White and Associates. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to introduce Mrs. Christy White as a partner from Christy and White to talk about um, our June 30, 2023 audit report. Good evening, and congratulations, Jeanette. Well deserved. Um, board members, Superintendent, uh, it's just a pleasure to be here tonight to present the audit. I've heard you've had a little bit of a first peek at the results, which are very positive. Um, but I'll go through kind of the highlights. If you have any questions, please let me know. As you know, the audit is required every year, and it's very comprehensive. It's the financial statements of the district, and then also all the federal and the state compliance areas. And each year, the state keeps adding on more and more compliance. Um, and so for the district to have passed all of these um, hurdles, if you will, in order to get and retain this money um, takes quite a lot of work by all the departments involved. So with the audit comes three opinions. The first is on the financial statements. And so the opinion that we have is the best that you can receive. It's in our opinion, the financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects. Um, so the unaudited actuals that you approve and are sent to the county and the state, um, we found them to be um, not only materially correct, but we had no audit adjustment, so great job there. Um, the second opinion is on that federal compliance that I spoke about. So each year we um, pick a couple of your major programs and you know we work with the categorical side as well as the business side and making sure that you're spending the money in a way that's allowable. Um, 
according to the terms of the grant, and we had no compliance findings, uh, no adjustments, so best opinion. And then last is the state compliance. Again, a lot of areas, everything from attendance to um, all the new monies that have rolled out with the, um, you know, the COVID pandemic funds, as well as LCAP and other buckets of money. And we had no compliance findings there either. So three best opinions and no recommendations. So good job. And uh, we really appreciate the staff um, in terms of working with us. There is so much data that needs to be gathered and uploaded and then samples and um, as Jeanette knows being a former auditor uh, it's all a lot of activity uh, time demand on their staff and so we appreciate their cooperation in working with us and any questions I'm happy to answer now any questions from the board I don't have any questions but I did want for the benefit of the community to know that it's more than just an opinion that you're reading up there. This is entire book of work that they had to do and everything you had to take a look at. So thank you for your work. Uh, thanks to the business office for everything that they did to put this together. I have taken a look at it. It is intense, but I appreciate the work yeah. that goes into it. Thank you. Thank you. Is thank this, you, Ms. Oh, sorry. No, go right ahead. Is the time? audit, I just have a question. Is the audit report available to the community? It, it's uploaded tomorrow? Okay, thanks. Well, thank you. Have a nice year. Our next item of business is uh, item 5.2, the Glendora High School Handbook Course Catalog, presented by the principal, Ms. Jamie Norell, and her staff. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. DeGrazia, President Mr. Clifford, Vice President Mrs. Garcia, and members Mrs. Merkley and Mrs. Reuter. We are pleased to present to you the 2024-25, it seems crazy to be thinking of that already, um, but our course catalog. With me this evening is our amazing GHS administrative team, assistant principals, Mr. Bondurant, Ms. Lozano, and Mr. Tilton, and our lead counselor, Mrs. Ashley. During this past fall, our staff worked on reviewing and revising our course catalog. The process starts with our department chairs working with their departments to review course descriptions and discuss possible additions to our course offerings. Our leadership team reviews those recommendations, then sends our draft of the catalog to the Educational Services Department for review and feedback. From there, it lands with all of you for a final set of eyes on review. Glendora High School is known for its robust and rigorous course offerings, and this year continues with that trend. We are thankful to the district who continues to support our efforts for diverse and innovative course selection. The following additions, deletions, and changes are minor in nature and do not require any adjustments to board policy. So to begin, I would like to introduce Mr. Rod Tilton, who will talk about our additions to the catalog. Thank you. We have two additions to our catalog this year, girls flag football and introduction to aviation, aerospace, and careers. As I believe all of you are aware that this past spring, CIF did make uh, flag football a CIF official sport for girls. And after meeting with our girls to gather interest from our students, uh, we are now working with the district to finalize plans for the sport. Uh, GHS is happy to offer another sport where our students can show passion on the field. Secondly, fundamentals of aviation. In the draft copy that you guys have, uh, the title will be Fundamentals of Aviation. This course will now be called Introduction to Aviation, Aerospace, and Careers. During the school year, we were one of the few schools in the area to offer our students such a unique opportunity of having a CTA uh, aviation pathway. The Fundamentals course was revised to serve as an introduction to the world of aviation and will highlight many career opportunities available in the aviation industry. Fundamentals of aviation also serves the need of an elective without the high levels of rigor of the pilot pathway. Next to discuss the deletions will be Ms. Luz Lozano. So this year we only have one course deletion, uh, honors pre-calculus. 
Due to the addition of AP Precalculus last year, this course is no longer needed in order to advance students to a different levels of math. Next to discuss the changes is our lead counselor, Mrs. Ashley. So we have just a few changes. Um, the first change has to do with our early college program. We did revise our language to allow more flexibility um, with the courses that we're offering each semester. This became necessary as we've needed to make adjustments from year to year based on instructor availability and working with Citrus. Um, the remaining changes will be addressed by Mr. Bondurant. We made two additional name changes to our course titles and these changes apply to our aviation pathway. Fundamentals of aviation will now go as aviation one. The fundamentals of aviation has changed as an introduction to the aviation aerospace and careers course Mr. Tilton previously mentioned. Aviation one introduces ground instruction and serves as the concentrator in the pilot pathway. Aviation pilot ground is now known as aviation two. Aviation 2 will serve in as advanced ground instruction course and will help prepare students for the Federal Aviation Administration's private pilot written exam. This course serves as the capstone for the pathway. This concludes our updates for the 2024-25 course catalog and we are happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, what a great team, what a great team. Any questions from the board? I feel one coming. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I do have a question. Um, as I was looking at the um, aviation, uh, as you were describing it, I noticed that the uh, computer science and robotics is, are included in next year's course catalog. I'm thrilled to see them here, though a little bit surprised. I just, uh, we're going to be able to maintain those sections for next year. So because we were still in flex, we have kept them in the catalog, and okay. I know that's still a conversation that we're having okay. with ROP, ROP and seeing where student interest lies. I hope so. Okay. Um, I don't have another question um, regarding this, but I do want to thank the team that you brought here tonight. Um, we talked about it. We got a little update in closed session as far as the incident occurred on the last day of school uh, finals. Um, and I just wanted to, as a board member and as a parent, um, thank you all for your um, clear and consistent communication um, and uh, organization, uh, the takeaways that you took from that as far as what you all did well and what we need to be hopefully never prepared for in the future. But um, I haven't had the chance to see you, but I wanted to say thank you very much for taking care of our kids and our, and our um, employees that day the way that you all did. Thank you. Thank you very much. You got off easy. Yeah, I know. Thank you. <laughs> Our next item is item number 5.3. It's a staff presentation on the LCAP and dashboard mid-year report presented by Dr. Jennifer Prince and Dr. Sarah Naharo. As Dr. Noharo presents the dashboard at the beginning, I'll stay here on the dais until we do trade and then it's gonna be a team effort and we'll actually have some other team members joining us during the process. Dr. Noharo. You gave me the clicker. Right. Uh -oh. I know. Oh, now, now I'm nervous. Okay. <laughs> I know. I wanna make sure I click it right. You guys know who we are, right? Okay, yes, good. All right, thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to uh, present the dashboard and um, mid-year LCAP this evening. For some of you, this may be not your favorite subject because it's a lot of data and a lot of information. It is my passion, it is what I love, but I'm going to try to embark that, uh, share that with you so you will find that same joy that I do. So <laughs> we always wanna start with um, grounding everything in our Glendora uh, vision and mission. Um, we wanna begin with this because, this because after we look at all of the data and the actions, we wanna always in the circle of continuous improvement, go back to the vision and mission and analyze where we are with that. So we always wanna start with that, with everything we do when we talk about data and we talk about goals and actions. And so I'm not gonna read it to you there, but it is presented. 
When we think about the dashboard, it's really important to remember that the dashboard is a growth model and it is grounded in certain principles. It is grounded in measurable up, um, outcomes and finding opportunities for growth. You need to look at it with an equity lens and that's a big piece of the dashboard and I'll talk about that um, later as well. There's a variety of indicators, lots of uh, multiple measures. We never want to look at something with one data point, we want to look at it to triangulate data or to look at it with a variety of points to see where we are and where we need to go. Um, the dashboard looks at academic and non-academic. It looks at a variety of groups. It, um, there's state data, district data, school data, and group data. Um, there are ways to present the data in, uh, with parent-friendly documentation and with parent-friendly charts. Um, and we always want to look at the data and make sure that this data then drives our goals and actions, which is our LCAP, which we're going to talk about later, and then is connected to our expenditures or our local control funding formula. So understanding the dashboard. So this year marks the return of the gas gauge or the colors of the dashboard. Last year, if you remember when I presented, it looked like cell phone bars and it was all one color purple because it was back to a status year. But years ago, actually the beginning of the dashboard, it looked like, I'm gonna show my age, Trivial Pursuit, it was little puzzle pieces. And then they moved it to the gas gauge and you'll see red all the way to blue. Now these colors are not just Red is one thing and blue is another. Of course, you want to be as full as you can be, um, but this is based on what we call um, status and change. So those colors are all based in what we call a five by five grid, and you'll see that grid is tiny in there. Um, there is a link to it um, if you see the digital copy, and it'll show you all the different five by five grids. So for every indicator that I'm going to share with you tonight, there's a separate what we call five by five grid um, because uh, the different measurements. One side of the five by five grid is always the current status, so where we are now, and the other part of the five by five grid is the change from one year to the next. And you will get a color based on your status and your change, and you that's kind of how you bring it together. So you could, in a situation have very high test scores, but maybe you decreased from the year. So you might've gone from a blue to a green instead of just staying at blue, even though your status is high. Or maybe our test scores aren't as high as we want them to be, but we had large growth from one year to another. So you'll see that gas gauge begin to move, not just based on the number, but based on the growth. The other key piece is that it is an equity report. One of the main purposes of the dashboard is to look at the whole all of your student groups, and then you look at each subgroup and see how is that compared to the whole. Not compared to other subgroups in different districts, not compared to other schools, but we're comparing to ourselves. So we're looking at a growth model of ourselves from year to year, and we're looking at our whole, we're looking at our subgroups, and then that's the time to really analyze where we need to dig in deeper. So that's a little bit of, about the dashboard. Um, so. When I'm talking about student groups, this is a little bit of a report on, on our student groups. Um, students are looked at by their belonging as well as their race and ethnicity. You'll see our largest subgroup, and this is all based on 22-23. So not this school year, everything I'm gonna share with you is based on last year's information. So last school year, our, so, um, our socioeconomic disadvantage group was at 42%. That will probably drop a bit this year um, due so, to some changes in the way um, we've reported that. Um, and you'll notice that although we have um, a significant number because no, one becomes significant in our eyes of homeless and foster youth, it's still under the number 30, which means we don't have reported um, data on that. Um, it's not what we call a significant subgroup that we're reporting data on. So when I go through the indicators, you'll see that they're in the no color band because we don't report on that. If it's the group is under 11 students, it, there's nothing, no information given because it's too identifiable and it becomes, um, it could uh, violate confidentiality of students. Um, you'll also notice that our Hispanic group is 48% uh, and our next largest group um, is our white, which is 29%. 
So the dashboard report, reports on two things, local measures and state measures. Our local, um, local measures um, are listed here. There's five of them. And I reported on these local measures to you last June when we presented the LCAP. Um, they become part of the LCAP. And then in um, September, we take all of that information and we upload it um, to the dashboard. So in June, you'll see me um, back here again to report on these local measures when we um, bring the new um, LCAP to you. So I'm not gonna go through all of the uh, data from the local measures, but to summarize, we met all of our local measures and those ba are based on um, some self surveys, um, uh, rating scales and uh, surveys. So we met all of that data. <clears throat> the next piece is the state measures. That is your academic performance. Um, that is your state tests, the CASP and ELA um, and math in grades three through eight and 11. Um, academic performance right now does not include the CAST, which is the science test as part of the dashboard. However, that will probably be coming in a couple of years, so a little preview. Um, we report on English language learner progress. Um, there's two pieces of English language learner process, which I'll go into, which is the LPAC, our summative assessments, and then progress from year to year. Chronic absenteeism, we've talked about that a lot, and I'll give you some details. Suspension rate, graduation rate, and then college and career indicators. Elementary school reports on one, two, three, and four, and high school, um, elementary and middle school, and then high school reports on number one, just for the 11th graders, um, two, four, five, and six. So um, chronic absenteeism on the dashboard is only K-8, and that's a really important piece, although we have data and we watch our high school as well. When it's reported on the, da the dashboard, it's only K-8 including, um, that includes TK. TK is wrapped up into K as first year of a two-year program. Today, I'm gonna share with you about all of the state indicators. I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of data. I'm gonna try to make it um, as easy to understand as possible. And then in a few weeks, our sites will begin their site presentations and they will follow the same pattern with their data. They're gonna give it to you from the lens of their specific school site. So this is our academic data and what, what is a little bit different on the dashboard is the dashboard re um, uh, reports the data for our academics as points above and below standard. Um, the better way to understand it, though, is to say that 61.84% of our students were proficient or above, which is, um, they just look at it two different ways. And you'll see that that put us in um, the uh, green category because we had um, test scores, and then that change, um, we increased 0.56 from the year before. Um, you'll also notice then that's a bro uh, broken down by our um, groups that I talked about. You'll see the ones on the bottom um, right say no, um, no color because of the size of the groups. And you'll also notice that we have no student groups in the red, although we have a variety of student groups in the orange, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, this data, again, is only grades three through eight to an 11 in our district. Um, when the school sites report on that data, they will also, they may talk about their um, primary grades, their K2 with their star data. And of course, the high school has a variety of assessments. So again, multiple measures, but this is what's reported on the dashboard. Um, when it comes to math, um, we were 51.47% proficient or above. This also put us in green, and we had an increase of 2.34% from the year before. Again, you'll notice that we had no student groups in the red. We had more of our student groups in math in the yellow because of their growth. Even though the scores were a little bit lower than language arts, we had more growth in those subgroups, and that's why you'll see more of them in the yellow than in the orange. And that's important to note because we all know that math is, continues to be an area of focus. Okay, the LP. The LP can be a little bit complicated um, because it kind of sometimes, it presents a little bit of skewed data. The LB is our progress of our EL students in grades one through 12, not kindergarten, from one year to the next. It uses 21-22 data and 22-23 data. So it has to be students that were with us for those two years. So it's not all of our EL students. So of those students that we have those two years worth of scores for, um, we can see we made some growth. Um, we had about 50, 
um, percent of our students making growth towards English language. That does not mean our EL students are not growing, it's just those particular students. One of the things we continue to grow in is the area of reclassification. That means our students that came that were EL and then we're moving them through. Um, and we've already reclassified 13 elementary students this year. And just right now we are working on our middle school and our high school reclassification. We needed to wait for first semester grades. Um, and then we will go through that process. So chronic absenteeism. Uh, we have discussed this many times as an area of concern. And again, I, like I pointed out, the dashboard shows K-8. And we had a 1.1% decrease from the previous year. Remember, decrease in chronic absenteeism is a good thing. You want to increase your test scores, but you want to decrease in your chronic absenteeism. Another way to compare it, even though I know we're not comparing, we're comparing our growth, but I think it does put perspective, the state was 25.4% with ours at 17.5. So again, the model of the dashboard is not to compare, but I think it gives us a little bit of a perspective, especially because that was not an issue pre-pandemic. This is a new issue to many districts across the state of California. You will notice that um, we do have two student groups in the red, that's our EL student group and our students with disabilities, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, one of the things I dug into the data a little bit more, not just in the dashboard, um, but this is some interesting information. We had 11.3% average days absent last year. So when we, uh, that was our average for those students. Um, remember, chronic absenteeism is, is there over um, 10 days absent in the year. So although we had a high um, rate of chronic absenteeism, it was 11.3 um, was their average. So easily able to make improvements in that, to bring that number down. Another interesting um, fun fact about chronic absenteeism, 70% um, um, of those absences were excused, and I don't think this is a, a surprise, but kindergarten had the highest number of students with chronic absenteeism. And we, all, and we know kinder, um, school, when we start looking at attendance, it's six years old that we can start enforcing things. So kindergarten, it, it's natural that that grade actually has the... Um, highest number of absenteeism. Um, currently, um, when I uh, looked at this data about a week ago, so as current as about a week ago, our K-12, so a little different than the dashboard, our K-12 um, positive attendance rate um, was at 94.7, and currently our K-8 chronic absenteeism rate is 10.5%. So already from the 17.5% um, from the previous year, we have showed a significant decrease overall. Um, our um, students with um, disability is um, decreased from 18, 24%, excuse me, to um, 18%. So we're definitely showing growth in um, those areas. Suspension rate. So um, our suspension rate here, um, we are in the green and you'll, you'll see the data represented there. Again, we have no student groups um, in the red. Um, we maintained, um, and it shows that we had a hundred, last year 166 students um, were suspended at least one day. Um, so um, one day of suspension, so it's not, the re it's not students repeated, it's if they had one day of suspension, um, and we maintain that. Um, we do have no, a little bit of an equity gap because we overall were in the green, but if you look, we have a significant amount of groups in the orange, um, and their rate increased by an average of 3%, those subgroups. Um, as I last looked at the data in preparing for this, we had 56 um, total suspended at least one day. So we are making um, a growth in decreasing that as well. Our graduation rate. So one of the ways the dashboard reports graduation rate is they, it's called a four and five year rate because we have some students that graduate in during that fifth year. Our four year rate is 96.9 and our five year rate is 0.3, um, which leads us to the 97.2% graduation rate. You will notice the next indicator, CCI, is has no color, and you're saying, oh, but Sarah, you said there's color back in your cheeks. No, it's still purple because last year we did not have CCI, and so it's a status year. CCI is college and career, the college and career indicator. Um, we are in medium in that. We do have one subgroup in the very low, which is our students with disabilities. We have two in the medium and two um, very high. The um, 
College and career readiness measure shows how many students graduate from high school better prepared for college and or career. It uses many different college and career measures, such as completion of coursework um, and work experience um, and their exam results. Um, to be prepared, you meet the um, at least one criteria um, in a three or above in language arts or math on the state test, a three or better on two, two AP exams, a C minus um, or better in two semesters in CTE where college credit is awarded. Um, you might receive the seal of biliteracy and um, or you might have a two or higher um, on uh, the state assessments. I think I said that twice, so apparently that's a good thing. Um, so <laughs> a little perspective prior, we're at 51.1%. Uh, um, again, we haven't had this indicator in a while, so I looked back. In 2018, we were at 57 0.1% for our CCI indicator. So we have dropped since pre-pandemic in 2018. Um, but again, this is the first year of um, reporting that. Also to note, if you add our 51.1% plus 193 which are approaching, so there's prepared, approaching, and not prepared. So if you add the approaching, um, we're at 70.4%. So um, I think that's of note. So this is my favorite slide. Lots and lots of colors, don't let it scare you. It's actually a slide that I think really simplifies the dashboard. It puts everything I just told you about in one place. So if you ever want to, to repeat it, and you don't really want to hear me, you can go to this slide and it'll tell you everything you need to know. Um, it'll show you overall, um, and which is all students, which is the column to the left, and then it breaks it down by each subgroup, each one of those groups, and it breaks it down by those state indicators. So you can look at it, and this the reason I love this report, because this is what the dashboard is all about. It's all about equity. It's all about us not just looking at how we're doing overall, which, if you look at that, mostly is in the greens and the blues. Um, we have one area, chronic absenteeism, no surprise, in the area of yellow. But what we want to do is look at those and look at all those subgroups and how is that compared? How many of those subgroups are also in those greens and blues and yellows? And those subgroups that are in the oranges and red, what, are, what can we do as a collective to continue to support the growth in those areas? Um, so you will see um, some areas of red, like I, I pointed out, um, but mostly we're in blues and greens, and we do have some oranges that we will we need to address, which we've talked about. Um, one of the things about this report, and I'm going to um, flip, and then I'll hopefully flip back if, it, if I'm allowed. Okay, so one of the things that this report does show us is that we are now in what we call differentiated assistance. And what is DA? DA is um, intended to assist LEAs um, in addressing the underlying causes that led to student, uh, low student outcomes while strengthening um, the LEA's ability to evaluate the effectiveness of strategies and program. It's really important to note that DA, or differentiated assistant, is not a status and it is not a label. It really exists to show what type of support the county provides to us. It's support in um, uh, the way they help us really dig deeper. It's not support in money. It's not monetary support. And it's not a ding. It's just similar to when we talk about tiers of support for academics or behaviors, our MTSS. There's different levels that we provide that we provide to others, and it's the same way as the county providing to us. So how, why, and how are we in differentiated assistance? There's a few different ways to be in differentiated system. There's th dis assistance. There's three ways, and we met it by the second way, which is we have two indicators that have one student group that's in the lowest, of, um, in the lowest area, a red or very low. So... I'm gonna flip back now. If you look at our students with disabilities, you will see that in chronic absenteeism, they're in the area of red. And if you look at co college and career ready, they're very low. Very low is a red if we had colors, but because it's a status here, we don't. So we had one group in two of the indicators. That's why we have differentiated assistance. Um, and it's uh, an area that we, 
are want to continue to dig deeper and really see what we can do and provide those goals in our LCAP to address that student group. So I wanted to make sure that we pointed that out. But there's a lot to be that is noteworthy when we summarize the uh, dashboard. We improved in both language arts and math in our overall academic scores. And overall, we had no student groups um, for our district that were in the red. Um, we also declined in absenteeism. We have an extremely high graduation rate. Um, we do know that there are some academic equity gaps that exist, but we're already starting to work to close those gaps. Um, we continue to make strides towards that vision and mission, which I pointed out at the beginning. We are adding, and we'll talk more about this in our LCAP update, but we've added intervention classes, different MTSS supports, professional development. I think um, we brought a larger awareness of the data and the supports that are needed, which if you don't know what the data says, how can you go about making those goals and actions to do it? So I think that's a really important piece. And of course, we're continuing to bring innovative programs um, to impact all of our students here in um, Glendora Unified. Um, most likely, it has not been announced yet, but most likely Lafetra and Sutherland, who are both in ATSI, which is uh, supports for schools that they were in that last year because of some of their subgroup data, they will come out of ATSI and not meet those criteria this year. Um, additional targets um, and supports. It's sort of like differentiated assistance, but at the site level. So how does this all work together? Um, this uh, image shows the cyclical um, plan, uh, the plan, do, check, act cycle, which is really what's key for continuous improvement. You'll see it starts with dashboard data. We look at the um, systems of support. Again, differentiated assistance plus the support that we provide um, with each other. That connects to the LCAP, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and to our school site, um, school plans. And then we continue with our uh, plans for action, and then of course looking at the data. So an example of showing how the data, the data of the dashboard um, impacts the LCAP, um, we will look at um, adjusting goals, for example, um, and making sure that we ad address attendance and engagement because our dashboard data continues to tell us that that's an area we need to address in the LCAP. So, um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Prince as she shares our mid-year LCAP update, which is a new requirement this year once the dashboard's been released. Why, thank you. So as Dr. Norhau said, this is a new requirement. This isn't our um, big presentation for the LCAP. This isn't when we vote on it. Um, we have not done our revision for our new cycle. This is a new requirement that basically says, kind of tell your board in some way, they didn't even give you a um, particular format you had to follow. Tell your board in some way where you are halfway through the 23-24 year, kind of what's going on. Um, and then we'll do the actual formal LCAP presentation where it's voted on and everything like that in June. So this is just kind of a mid-year update. Um, and the reason we combined it with the dashboard is because they do ask you if there is data available, please share that. Because it's mid-year, the dashboard is really the available data. So that kind of tells you where we're at, although the dashboard is built on last year's test, our CASP scores. So just info there. All right, and this is just the additional background, the Senate bill that requires us to do the mid-year update at a regularly scheduled board meeting. So as you can look, um, I am not going to read these all out to you. It is a lot of information and we would be here all night, but I'm gonna give you a few highlights. So as you know, goal one is student achievement. It is our biggest goal with our largest number of actions because it's incredibly important. Um, so you can see that takes two slides. Um, but to start with our first, I want to um, actually invite up Mrs. Kent, our Educational Programs Coordinating Teacher, to give just a brief update on AVID. Thank you, Dr. Prince. Good evening, esteemed board, Dr. DeCrazia. Thank you for having me. Um, so for our student achievement, 
We've added more staff members to our AVID train team, which is a really big success. So we've had 23 staff members that attended AVID Summer Institute, eight staff members that attended the national convention just in November, and that bolsters our foundation for a really strong deployment in our elementary school staff members, and then that also fortifies our veteran AVID teachers with new insights and equitable instructional practices to help our students achieve more in the classroom and beyond. We've also hired nine new tutors this year to fill the roster to support our high school and our middle school um, AVID students. We are focusing our efforts on tutor retention strategies to maintain new and previous hires. Um, at GMS, SMS, and GHS, um, our coordinators and electives have expanded based on this amplified training. Um, Lafetra, Sellers, and Sutherland administration and teacher teams have been trained, um, ready to share more AVID instructional practices um, with our organizational note-taking and inquiry-based strategies um, with the staff members to help students understand how to do school a little bit better. Um, and then also, I, it says Mrs. Daniela Kent started this year, and I have that in my notes. She's wonderful. I hope you've had a chance to meet her. <laughs> Could have skipped over that one, but I thought I would mention it. Um, we are also holding um, more site coordinator meetings so that we can get together um, and frequently articulate our AVID goals, share strategies, um, and then discuss our shared district goals and initiatives. Uh, we've also uh, la launched the AVID Learner newsletter, incorporating families into our communication and the celebration of student activities, wins, strategies, events, and in the AVID way in school. Um, I'm currently developing our AVID Pathfinder series with our AVID staff, um, which is kind of the marriage of AVID and GATE um, spe speakers and as well as in a mentorship for students throughout the year, and that's coming this spring. Um, and it essentially entails a night of guest speaker rotations, um, Q&A time, and the invaluable role of mentorship for our students throughout the year. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. I have a question. Oh, wait, wait. Actually, it'll be specific to AVID. Let's hold them until wait. the end, okay. and then you can just barrage with the whole team. All right, a few of the other highlights I just want to point out. Um, we continue to be a one-to-one -one district. We will continue. Um, as we write, we are currently working on our next LCAP cycle, as well as the reflection of our current LCAP cycle. Um, and we are really cognizant of the fact that those devices diminish over time, and that we are making sure we are saving the resources to do a refresh to ensure that we remain a one-to-one -one district as well as having the infrastructure to support those devices. Um, we also continue our dedication to MTSS, our multi-tiered systems of support, so making sure our students have various resources they need. We have our student support specialists at all sites, our counselors at our secondary sites. We have um, Ms. Wilson, who is leading that charge and are doing wonderful things with her and Dr. Murray in MTSS. We also, you've heard it and you'll hear it numerous times because as you can tell, a lot of times the goals and actions sort of overlap. Um, so our aviation has expanded in our CTE pathways, and that's one of our goals um, in a few different places, expanding our CTE pathways. And now we are going to be moving that into our middle schools to gain exposure. And Mrs. Kent will update on GATE in a little bit, but we're going to be adding an aviation um, exposure class in our GATE sessions. Um, and then the other key part here on this first slide is our teacher and administrator capacity building. We have really make a lot of efforts to make sure our teachers, our staff members are cutting edge. We want to make sure we continue to provide that top-notch education we're known for and the best for our students. So we have to be on top of what's happening in the learning environment too. So from conferences, professional development, our educator effectiveness academies, um, we are constantly moving on this, and we have a lot going on just in the first half of the year, and excited for more plans um, for the second half of the year as we do so many different things for our staff development. Goal one continued. 
Um, with this one, a few of the things I want to mention is our um, innovative technologies. We have a lot of educational technology resources for our teachers, not just our Chromebooks. Um, and I couldn't even begin to name them all, but some of them district-wide, um, Edpuzzle, uh, Renaissance Star, Alex is a program that supports math, ESGI, Reading Eggs, so many different programs um, that really support our teachers in that innovative instruction that we have. We continue to support those not only with paying for the programs, but also with supporting um, through our site technology leaders at each type, at each site, those teachers. Um, and then I'm actually going to bring back up Dr. Naharo because our final three on this slide, I'm gonna defer to her. Okay, so uh, the final three um, actions are um, areas that I spend a lot of time with, which is our EL access and support and our um, academic um, interventions, which then of course would include our extended school year, all different ways to support our students um, in areas that they need. So for EL, um, we actually um, have a lot of professional development happening um, using our elevation uh, platform with strategies. We have, um, I think we have 14 teachers doing um, the strategies educator effectiveness um, academy. We have our EL support leads that also are having more intensive trainings on EL. Um, um, and our ELD teachers at the middle school and high schools have had um, training on ILA, and then we're also exploring some different other curriculums to see what might best support our EL students. Um, and we've really increased the awareness of uh, supporting our ELs in all areas, and all of our elementary teachers that have ELs um, receive their EL companion that goes with the Wonders curriculum. Um, every time a new EL student is enrolled, we make sure that they are um, having an EL companion workbook for those students. Um, for our interventions, as you know, we were um, we adopted Spire as our reading intervention program. So all of our reading um, ELA reading intervention teachers are um, teaching a systematic um, reading program. We also um, have our math intervention teachers. Um, they are piloting different programs, um, as well as um, supporting with pre work and uh, review work from our adopted uh, math uh, text. Um, and then as far as extended school year, we had a very successful summer acceleration last year where, we're, where we added um, enrichment and specials and we're starting already our planning. We had our first planning meeting in January for our next summer acceleration. Um, and then we are, um, continuing with before and after school opportunities at different sites for intervention, and of course with credit recovery, um, making sure that we find ways to support all of our students in completing A to G requirements. Thank you. Looking at goal two, safe, healthy, and 21st century schools, some of the biggest things I want to point out, just the highlight, safety and security for physical safety and security. We had fencing and gate access at Williams are continuing to be fine-tuned and perfected. We had both middle schools had fencing surveys that were in progress. Um, we were walking with those site administrators. Um, with Anthony and with Mr. Osborne and myself, um, and that is to secure the front of the schools. Um, and then Mrs. Espino has been hard at work on our PA system un upgrades um, and helping to lead the charge on that. Virtual safety, we also have a lot of things in place. Securely is in place for web filtering, but it does a lot more than that. And it, it also hits in two goals, but I'll talk about it more here. There's also um, a warning where when you have students who might be searching something um, dangerous or disturbing, it not only gives them potential resources for support, it also notifies Mrs. Espino, who then reaches out to myself and the site principal, and we can, even if a student is searching for something dangerous at home, we can actually um, dispatch help to them immediately um, because of the securely filters looking, watching, and giving us that warning if they're using their student accounts. Another highlight on this is promoting positive social emotional learning and cultural esteem. We have our character strong, our wellness rooms, a return of a lot of clubs and enrichment programs at our sites um, that really help connect our students to our schools and reach them in a lot of different ways, what their interests are. Um, we have our wonderful student support specialists and counseling team that you'll hear 
mentioned over and over again, they are an amazing asset. Um, we also have each site was allotted money to support their efforts in creating and celebrating cultural awareness, um, celebrations and experiences on their campus. And we did some shared templates. Um, shout out to Dr. Rick Baradian, who is wonderful with this. And he was kind enough to make copies of his, um, his newsletters, his social media, so that the other principals could have access to those um, in Canva to copy and maybe utilize little snippets for their newsletters. So we've been doing a lot of support. And then the other thing on here is GATE, and I'm going to welcome back up Mrs. Kent to do our update on our GATE offerings and progress. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to start with um, our GATE screening um, to identify our third grade GATE students. Um, we've uh, moved to the online screening of all students during the school day um, to provide a more equitable opportunity um, for identification. Um, in speaking of the equitable access, um, we also have translation of the audio um, during the testing in eight different languages. Um, as our English learners, it's the fastest growing population and often the most underrepresented. Um, so this gives them an opportunity to be screened for gifted education. We've also increased field trips, including the, um, the elementary level. Uh, we most recently went to the Huntington Library with fourth and fifth graders, which was really exciting. We are including more hands-on and in-person workshops and offerings um, in our workshops that come out twice a year. Um, and we're also leveraging community partnerships and resources um, to showcase future career opportunities for our students in the area. We also, like it was mentioned earlier, have aviation um, that is currently being set up at Goddard, which we will be using for our workshops and as well as a, an upcoming summer program. Um, we also have a robust calendar that's put out twice yearly with a new platform for students to have, or for parents, excuse me, to have more transparency and control over um, the creation of that enrichment workshop for their children. And then we're starting to build our summer program, um, which is in flux right now, but I can mention that we are looking at that aviation gate uh, program to be, um, to come in the summer program, as well as partnerships um, that we've added through the Energy Coalition, Girls Who Code, um, as well as that Pathfinder series that we're hoping to also add as a um, gate workshop as well. Thank you. And I also want to mention that the although the aviation lab is housed at Goddard, it will be both um, both middle school gate students will have access to those workshops. Just like when we house a workshop at Stanton, any of our elementary gate students can attend that. Um, but the facility will actually be at Goddard. So our next one is our community engagement goal. Um, a lot of, we have really refined and improved our communication methods. The biggest one, a shout out to Mrs. Espino, our website revamp, stellar. Very user friendly, we've had great feedback on it. She's constantly updating that. Um, that was a big one. We use Parent Square Communication, that is one communication hub, um, and it also allows parents to set their native language so it will translate those messages, not PDF attachments, but the body of the message can be translated into their native language, um, which is lovely. Continuing with social media, we have our monthly and quarterly newsletters, a shout out to Ms. Wilson on those. We are also adding Let's Talk, which Dr. DeGrazia has introduced a few times, and that's just another mode of communication to make sure that we are um, getting as much information out there as we can. Um, and of course, none of this takes the place of the really important face-to-face, -face, those in-person, having those parent communication nights, having the parent and student advisory boards that we have with Dr. DeGrazia. Um, it's just making sure that wherever they are, we're trying to meet them where they are to get the communication out there. Um, and I also want to welcome back on this goal, Ms. Wilson, our Director of Student and Family Support Services, to talk about what's happening at Glendora Gives, our Parent and Family Resource Center. Thank you so much. Um, 
just a quick update on Glendora Gibbs. Glendora Gibbs, uh, we're going to have a soft opening this Friday with our counselors and student support specialists. We're really excited about that. We had our first community drop-off uh, donation day on Friday, December 22nd. Um, and as it was noted, our community is very generous. We got a really uh, great start on donations that day. Um, in addition, we got some uh, support from our County Office of Education, LACO, um, gave us a lot of toiletry and personal care items, which is much needed. Um, we had an additional donation today from Faith Church. Um, we're pretty well stocked and ready to go. We'll be meeting with the counselors on Friday to walk them over to the center so that they um, have a chance to, to check it out. We've got a needs assessment form created. We'll um, unveil that shortly. Anyone in our district will be able to um, alert us that there's families in need, um, and then we will uh, discreetly make appointments with those families to, to shop for whatever they need. Um, you saw some of our, our numbers of foster and homeless um, earlier to, uh, this evening. We do anticipate that those numbers are probably not quite as reflective as they should be of our um, our homeless population um, specifically. Um, and so to that end, Glendora gives us not just for a specific um, group or demographic of students or families, um, it really will be for all families that have um, any sort of, of needs. So soft opening this Friday, um, our uh, AP Studio Art class is making our logo right now. Um, so we should have that shortly. We have some judging to do. Um, and then once we have that logo, we'll um, do an opening for, for all community. Thank you. All right, and on to our final goal, goal four, fiscal solvency. I'm going to bring up my teammate, Mrs. Walzak, and um, some of, let's see, a lot of this is combined, um, but we have actions one and three have been achieved. Um, there's continuous with the Inform K-12, our system where we're monitoring um, forms in their positions remain in place for position control, and we do have the 6% reserve completed. Um, some of the things we are continuing to build partnerships, as you heard both from uh, Mrs. Kent and Ms. Wilson, as they were talking about reaching out and having those types of community partnerships that give to our different programs. We also work with um, Kiwanians, Rotary, Kiwanis, Glendora Coordinating Council, so many different partnerships that we develop to support our schools and that's part of this goal. We're continuing to work on enhancing our tech infrastructure, or I mentioned how some of these things go to different goals. Um, our Wi-Fi renewal, you'll see on our agenda tonight. We have an upcoming phone system upgrade to make sure we are um, have functional phone systems. And we're also happy to report, although this is not LCAP funding, um, that the seller slide was replaced and that we have started the process with Anthony on a revamp of one playground at each of our elementary school sites with our um, extended learning opportunity uh, program money, so our ELOP money. So those are great things. Um, as another highlight, we have our expansion of programs. Again, this is our aviation pathway edition, moving that to the middle school to build that experience and program. A lot of arts on the way, which will especially be supported by our Prop 28. Um, Mrs. Kubota, our VAPA coordinating teacher, has done a wonderful job working with all of our different visual and performing arts teachers this year to really look at what do they want? What do they need? And then we just presented that to our principals and we'll be digging in more with the principals on, okay, so what does this mean for our programs? Um, because our goal really is to figure out which positions we need and be the first ones to post them so that we can get the very best for our arts program. Um, we also have our dual language class, as Dr. DeGrazia mentioned, that's starting at Sutherland, the kindergarten class, next year. Um, and now, because as you've seen, this is a team effort that LCAP is owned by a whole lot of people. I am going to welcome up Mrs. Walzak for the mid-year LCAP budget overview. Great. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Prince. So just a quick update of where we are. 
Um, so basically, we're showing the different goals. Goal one, student achievement. We budgeted eight million one hundred ninety-seven thousand two hundred and twenty. Our, our estimated expenditures to the end of the year, once we finish off the year, is seven point nine million. And then goal two, safe, healthy, twenty-first century learning environments. We budgeted about three million um, eighty-eight thousand five hundred fifty-four. And our estimated expenditure is three million one hundred twenty thousand nine hundred, and then goal three community engagement budgeted three hundred sixty one thousand nine hundred fifty five, estimated at three hundred fifty five thousand two hundred and ninety, and then goal four fiscal um, solvency um, based on the different actions, and this is a larger number because part of it too is the some of the staffing costs associated with some of the act this action and that's sixty seven million one hundred fifty eight thousand two hundred and ninety and expenditures to date uh, or es estimated expenditures to the end of the year is sixty seven million two hundred and nine thousand nine hundred sixty five and oh and just a little chart that kind of il that illustrates each of the the goals and where we are as far as the budget and where we expect to end um, at the end of the year. And that wraps up our LCAP presentation mid-year update. <laughs> now we're open for questions. Thank yes. you. And we will just, as the question is pertaining to each person, we will just bring them over to answer that. Thank you. I, I don't know quite how to do the questions, so I guess we'll just go from each person, and if, you, if they jump around, I was hoping we could do it by genre, but let's just start to our far right and shoot. Okay, I just have a couple of things. The English learners, when they test out, do they, are they continue to be supported? Or yes. are they just kind of thrown um, out? When students are reclassified, they have to meet certain criteria right. um, to be reclassified, and then they are monitored um, for four years. And each year, um, we have forms that teachers fill out um, to say whether they need um, additional supports um, because it's language, perhaps it's um, they need just an IST for academics or they're doing okay. And I will tell you, um, I'm not gonna throw the numbers off out offhand, but our reclassified students outperform our, uh, the rest of our students on in every area. So um, our reclassified students are having great success. That's great, probably because they know two, la two languages. Yeah. Thank, that's yep. great. Um, graduation rate, is that a combined Glendora High School and Whitcomb? Correct. Okay. I'm just it's district wide. There. Um, okay, the aviation, after school. Transporta I'm just transportation. You're saying that the Sandberg Goal um, Gate kids get, can access Goddard, but how do they get there? So just like with any of our gate workshops, that would be parent transportation. However, there is the city um, teen shuttle mm -hmm. that's accessible and goes between a few of our sites. I know they're working on routes right now, um, but that goes between Sandberg, Goddard, GHS, but it is available. But the primary mode of transportation for any of our great workshops right. is um, is parent transport, and that is why we tend to have them at various different sites, so that that way, if there is a student who like, I just don't have a ride to get there, there's at least a few at their own homeschool site they can attend. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Let's see. I should have written them on one page, but I didn't. So. Let's see. I think that's it. Thank you. All right. Great job. Really enjoyed that presentation. Sarah, you almost have me. I almost have you. Almost have me. <laughs> hey, I did not fall asleep. I almost did. Okay. <laughs> We've been up very early today. Hey, you were talking fast, and that's it. I like fast. So thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Garcia? Okay. Uh, the college and career readiness, and you said uh, that it dropped from 57.1 That was in 2018. Right. Yeah. What do you think has attributed to that, and what are we doing to increase that number? Um, that is probably, there's a variety of causes um, that are impacting that. I would say one of, 
the um, impacts is our subgroups, so our students with disabilities really um, do struggle to meet our A to G requirements, um, and that is an area that we continue to focus on. We have our um, A to G um, improvement grants, so we are using those monies to provide um, extra services and opportunities for credit recovery, um, for tutoring, uh, for a variety of um, services. It will also be supporting our, um, uh, give me a second because I'm drawing a blank and I don't know why I am, our uh, Tartan University, thank you, um, to be able to continue to support all of our students meeting the A to G requirements. Um, the other piece is when we look at um, the data, it's based on our 11th grade students meeting um, or exceeding standards in um, on the state assessment. And we all know, so that was a year, um, a year ago, 11th graders. Um, that was their first year back from pandemic. Um, so that's, that's what that data is based on. So last year, seniors took the test in 11th grade, um, and that was our first year back as a testing year. So those are all impacts of the pandemic. What percentage of our students um, in 11th grade are, I mean, I know that's very specific, but are considered special education? Um, I don't have by 11th grade off the top of my because head. Because these, these numbers are based on 11th graders, right? No, 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 they no, no, no. Test. They're, um, the, for a career, a college and career ready is based on our 12th graders last year, but it was the information from their test scores is based on the 11th grade when they were in 11th grade. I guess grade. what I, maybe I'm not wording this properly. Okay. How much of an impact does the spe uh, special education have on that number for our total college and career readiness? I, it, it is a big impact okay. because that's the area that's in the very low. In, when you look at our subgroups, if you remember that one slide. So um, you don't have the number, the, that, the percentage of college and career readiness without our special education? Um, no, they, I, I do not have that. Can I can you? Work, I can work on that, yes. Okay. And question about AVID. How many AVID students, no, I'm not going to ask that number specific question, but have we had an, an increase in interest or need for AVID um, instruction? Like, are there more kids applying to be an AVID or kids that are being recommended to be an AVID than in the past? And are we meeting those needs? Like, do we have enough classes at Goddard, at all the schools, to be able to, to serve the students that want to be an AVID? Yes, so we are always working on, and part of the reason for the newsletter is to bring more awareness to parents and to those in the community that we have these services available um, as an elective, and then also we're starting down in the lower elementaries um, to get students prepared for you know, the, the way that we function in school and how we achieve that success. Um, and when there are more electives available to students, um, we see a slight drop in the AVID numbers, but we're trying to, again, maintain and show students that, you know, all of these things that you'll receive help with, the, you know, the road to college and all of the other um, exposure that they get to the college-going atmosphere is present in AVID. Um, and so just making that more well-known to the um, the student population and parents so that, you know, when they register, when they apply, which is coming up in the spring, they know that they have, you know, there's always space for them. We have lots of teachers trained and we also have that, you know, to support the students. That was my next question. How many of our teachers, like let's just stick to the middle schools, are AVID trained and can some of these tools that are useful in the AVID classroom, I mean, they're useful to ed everyone, every Absolutely. student. So and, yes. why not implement some of those in every classroom, even though it's not AVID specific? Well, it, they, and it's funny that you should mention that. So let's start from the elementary school level. So now that we're starting at the elementary school level, teachers are trained, admin teams are trained. So the organizational strategies, the inquiry-based um, strategies are present there, and they're going through. So now they start from a younger age. They continue those practices now that we have a larger um, staff that is trained, trained in those strategies. Um, and at the middle school level, I can give you an exact number. Um, I can work on that. But I have, um, we just have, I think we have eight at middle school, at least eight from each site. Um, I believe maybe that's a generous number. But they're, all, all staff members are very familiar with this. And our AVID teachers, in fact, Goddard just made a presentation, I believe, earlier um, on Monday. Um, 
they made a presentation to staff using some of these strategies and they share them frequently. So teachers are talking about it in their staff meetings and they are using the practices. You'll see signage around the campus too. Um, at both Goddard and Sandberg in the middle schools, for example, they do frequently use that. And then at the high school level, the same is there. In fact, I think today, or no, again, yesterday during um, late start meetings, there was an avid presentation from a student sharing with the staff. So it's constantly being brought up, and that's something that all teachers are aware of. Um, those who have been specifically trained have, you know, a, a larger breadth of knowledge, but they consistently share it with their staff members. Good. That's good to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The multi the MTSS, is that something that just our counselors and interventionists have been trained in, or is this something that is reaching all of our teachers and staff? Yeah, so this is reaching all teachers and staff. Mr. Osborne was heading this a few years ago. Now it is Ms. Wilson and um, Brian, Dr. Murray. Uh, and I would say that some, though, may not recognize it as MTSS if they haven't had the formal training. Some, when you say it's RTI or RTI squared, response to intervention, um, that's kind of the terminology that they learned it under. Um, but we are working on those. Here's what happens tier one in the classroom. This is every student, um, whether it's social, emotional, or academic. And then tier two is you're taking it to the next level. This is where it needs to go to a small group with a student support specialist or the intervention teachers or things like that. And then, OK, this still isn't working yet. We have the tier three, and that's where you bring in those special education assessments and our education specialists. So um, yes, it's happening across the board, but we are working on more consistent messaging um, and that's starting to be rolled out with our principals. Okay, thank you. And then do we have, and maybe this is gonna be presented when the, each site does their presentation. So please uh, excuse me if I'm jumping the gun. Do we have data on SPIRE and the math intervention programs that we've been using this academic year as far as is it working, is it not working? Um, I don't, we don't have it as of yet um, because it's very new in the implementation. Um, I don't, uh, we'll share some of the STAR data, but the um, SPIRE is, will be a year long program. Um, we'll see how many kids move through the different levels and then how many kids exit um, intervention. So they will be probably be reporting out on their number of students that they're serving um, and then as we look at the intervention over time um, it's such a short window right now to report that data the data would be skewed and not valid um, as far as the math intervention again it'll be about how many students are served as we look at data over time um, we are just doing second trimester um, unit assessments, so we don't have all of those data points to report out to as of yet, but it would be something that we can do um, as the year ends when we talk about the 2425 LCAP. How long have we been using SPIRE? SPIRE just started this year. We did training um, in, in August, in August okay. um, and we started to implement after universal screenings um, mid to late September, so it's still very in its infancy stages. But as far as like testing a child, you mm -hmm. know, where like you could see improvement if that child is yes because they're, they're making um, the way spire works is um, students test to move through the program um, if they're not making strides then there's like lesson one for example in order to go to lesson two they have to meet a certain um, data point if not they'll have lesson 1b or lesson 1c before they move on so every I mean the the uh, reading intervention teachers are seeing anywhere from 50 to 70 students and they have those data pieces per student because they know who's moving through what lessons in each group right now we have not compiled all of that data because it's it's ever moving and ever changing um, as it's going on are the kids to inspire like in their classroom or are they being pulled out to do like a math intervention? That program? is, a, Spire is a reading pull out intervention program. Mm -hmm. There are some other reading intervention programs that are tier one that teachers are doing and our intervention um, in our reading intervention rooms. There are some other reading comprehension and fluency go programs going on to supplement, but our main program is uh, the Spire um, phonemic awareness program. Okay. Thank you. I'm just still flipping through these pages, but yep. if anybody else wants to go, and I'll, I'll, if I find another question, I... Thank you, Board Member Garcia. Mm -hmm. Board Member Reuter. 
The beauty of going last-ish is most of your questions get answered for you. So I actually don't have any additional questions, but I do want to thank you all, and I do want to thank you for bringing in all the different members of your team. I personally really appreciate hearing. Dr. Naharo, you are in the right place. This is you. This is a good. Um, thank you very much. But having Mrs. Kent come in, Mrs. Wilson come in, ha hearing from people individually, I personally really appreciate hearing from the subject matter expert. So thank you for including everybody this way. I have one more. Mr. Clifford. Oh, I have one more. I forgot. I didn't see my circle. I okay. have some too, Council Member Merkley, but go right ahead. Thank you. Maybe you won't have any when I'm done. Okay, graduation rate. I noticed that the English learners, there aren't enough, these little lines. Does that mean that we have reclassified them by that time and there are only so few? No, um, that is... Are you talking about in here? Yeah. Okay, so um, that graduation rate right there, yeah. the subgroup would have to be 30 or more students. Right. And it's showing right now at the high school, we have 90 students, grades 9 through 12. Mm -hmm. So it's just um, that there's not enough numbers, uh, students to report. Okay. So I we are reclassifying more and more students, but I can't say that that's the cause of why we only have why we have less than 30. Um, it may be an, one of the impactful factors, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's a direct causa causation. We can be optimistic. Yes. I'm just going to leave that up because that's my favorite slide. <laughs> okay, this isn't so much a question, but more of a thank you to all of you for this very thorough presentation. I appreciate it. I'm actually glad that this has to be done now and not wait till the end. I, I amid point update is, is, is always nice. Uh, but specifically, I want to thank Ms. Kent, because I know you just started in this role, but as a parent of uh, two GATE students, I have noticed a, a, a difference in the program already, in the programming. Thank you for listening to us, because I do see that you've, I mean, I've, I've been on the Zoom calls, and so I see that you're taking the feedback from the parents, and you're actually implementing it. So it's nice to see that process. So I appreciate you taking the time to even listen to our crazy ideas and then um, putting them into action. It's actually very gratifying to see that. So thank you for the work that you do. I appreciate it. Just a few questions. I'm confused, so confused on a couple of things. Um, but the uh, first question I have has to do with the data points and the populations that you measured. For instance, when you look at chronic absenteeism slide and it says all students in the population field is 4,225, <clears throat> if we have approximately 6,600-ish students, does that mean that 4,225 of the population of 6,639 were absent 10 days or more? No. That's so explain that population field to me because it's it's uh, fluid and it changes everyone and it's it's confusing to me. So I, I think maybe what this is what Dr. Nahara was talking about with um, the chronic absenteeism is actually based on only K-8 students, um, TK-8 students. So our high schoolers are actually not included okay. in this. That doesn't mean we don't. Dr. Nahara looks at that often, and we look at the chronic absenteeism, but it's not actually reported on the dashboard. The dashboard so is only the number of students it's reporting on. So it's is not 4,225 okay. students total. That's K-8. K-8, so, so yes. it's not an LCAP concern above 8. Well, uh, so I will say um, it is not a current LCAP goal or action. Okay, that's all. That's good However, enough. This is part of that cyclical data. We look at this and we say it needs to be an action on our next. Or I, I could argue, I could sure. argue easier that if you focus on it from K to eight, the problem won't exist okay. from nine to twelve. The, so the dashboard, the dashboard <laughs> reports K to eight. However, we look at a variety of data gotcha. points. So the data points on the bottom, that's K twelve. Okay, I understand at least that okay. point better. Um, I, I have a I have a concern with the students with disabilities. Um, yeah. is, is the very low rating? Do, it, first off, the category of student with disabilities does that include 
the adult, the 18 to 22-year-old students that are in the adult program after? No, it does not. So that, it's only, it's tell, only me, tell me what this population includes. Yeah, the population of our students with disabilities is our students um, but it doesn't TK yeah. through 12. So it's okay. Um, and it could be students in, that have any eligibility that give them an IEP. So it could be our, our students with speech and language. It could be students that are um, in uh, specialized academic instruction. Um, it could be students in a special day class. It could be students that are on monitor that are not receiving any pullout or separate class services, but they still have an IEP, so they have accommodations. So any students that are on an IEP with an eligibility in TK through 12th grade in the different areas. If you for academics, of course, it's third through eighth grade and 11th. So whatever grade that indicator is measuring. So it's any of our students with an IEP. So it's the students that are older than 18 and whatever that group is. They're not is, part of this. They're data. not part of that at no. all. Yeah. Okay. And our Sprouts program is not part of this data. Okay, that makes sense then. But it's just statistically interesting to me that pretty much that group of students aren't measuring well in any of those categories, yet they're green in graduation rate. I, did, I mean, I would want to tear that apart statistically and want to know how that well, works. Mm -hmm. well, remember, that's just measuring the 12th graders. So it's a much smaller smaller group. And it's our, our students with disabilities are graduating high school. They're okay. graduating through our high school. We, only have, we have a very small percentage of our students that do not graduate high school. All right. And then my last question, just functionally, mm -hmm. is the LCAP, I looked at it while you were talking, I looked at some of my notes, and it, improving student outcomes, right? That's what the entire budget goal. So explain to me how putting fences and gates up at Williams has anything to do with improving student outcomes. So, so the LCAP actually has to do all of the different state priorities. And one of those priorities is facilities and safety. Um, so that's, you, you interweave those through there. Um, but part of it also, when you're improving student outcomes, when you're keep, keeping them safe at school, they can focus and they can learn. So it is sort of strange when it's weaved in there, when you have things like safety with fences, but it's part of those state um, priorities and that's why we have it interwoven. But we, do we have students that attend Williams School? Yes. Yeah, so we have a few of our programs down there. We have Tiny Tartans, we have our Sprouts Preschool that's for our special education students, and then we um, have our daycare that runs there during school breaks and um, summers. And after school. And after school programs. And we also have, so our ELOP program is a huge piece of what we need to make sure we're offering that enrichment for students um, TK through six. I didn't know that. I just learned, it just seems to me that I don't want to dilute our efforts where we have other things. And I had I didn't know <clears throat> that we had students go to Williams. I thought I thought the people that were at Williams weren't students that we got reimbursed for. I thought it was a daycare or something like that. But if we do if we do have students that are TK through 12 students that go there. There, um, so our students that go there are our preschool students and our special education preschool students. And then daycare, they do have some during, like we said, during breaks and summer that you might have the, the TK-12 students there for daycare during the summer. During the school year, um, they're primarily their daycare is at their school site. So a seller student goes to seller's daycare. Uh, but when the summertime, they will use it at Williams. Um, but all the time we have our Tiny Tartans, um, which is our general education preschool. And, uh, and then we have our Sprouts, which is our special education preschool. And, and th those are considered students as far as LCAP goes? No, they're actually separate funding. <laughs> it's, it's sort of a, um, it's a mix. So um, we, we had actually, we're talking about this, the three of us on the car ride home from our, our governor's budget. Then I, then I don't feel so bad being confused. Yeah, no, nope, nope. there is, um, there is sort of the confusion because there's certain things you have to put in there because of state priorities. For example, you put maintaining your facilities. But when you look at LCAP funding, what they give you just for student achievement, that's, there's no way that's going to cover it all. So 
you have to kind of mesh the different resources. So you're right, it's completely confusing, and I don't know if there's anybody but um, Jeanette who might actually completely <laughs> be like, yeah, I got this. I just, I will follow up more personally on that. I just, I just don't understand the goal of the LCAP and then putting money into Williams if it doesn't relate to improving student outcomes if we don't have students that attend that building. That's all. It's To me, it's a, I'm a simple man. It's a simple process. I don't need to create the illusion people go there if they don't. I just wanted to know why we're spending money there if it doesn't improve student outcomes because there's no measurable student outcome that comes out of that building, I believe. I could well, be wrong. I would say some I don't of know it, enough about it but. on the other side, there's outcomes later. So as they go to our tiny tartans and our sprouts, it prepares know, them to go to TK and K. Um, but I don't know if we have data. To, I mean, that's anecdotal at best. Absolutely anecdotal. But I would say that that prepares them. But you're right. There is some some sort of the LCAP covers a lot of different things. What we're hoping to do, really, there's been excitement in as we start to write our next LCAP. Um, and this one, there's a lot of excitement with the team. We've sort of been meeting in small groups, and we've um, I called them like our dream sessions. As we look at revising and really clarifying our goals and actions, and that's really what the LCAP is about. It's to drive our decisions. We look at the data, we look at the feedback, we get the surveys, we build these. Okay, these are the goals of our district that meet our vision. These are the actions we're going to take to get there. And now, as we start a fresh cycle. We really get to dig in and, and just kind of look at it with fresh eyes to make it um, clear for our vision. I'm not arguing that a fence or a gate need to be repaired at a school facility. I'm just, I mean, there's, but there's money for that somewhere. Yeah. I don't understand the connection to LCAP is all I'm saying. Uh, one of it reported in a form of goals if there's no measurable outcomes from that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Completely, yes. Okay. I, yeah. I was just paying attention. I couldn't make that nexus. I'll, I'll, I'll yield my time back. Any other questions, comments? Okay. All right. Anything else we need to do other than accept this report right now? Nope. That's it. Just well, a presentation. Is this going to be linked because it's not currently? The presentation will be linked. Yeah. Okay. So for the audience at home. I know everyone's excited to dig into this. <laughs> well, thank you very much. That concludes all of our presentations for this evening. We move on to the exciting section six. Aiden, would you like to be excused for the evening or you want to hang out? You, you know, Aiden, by the way, anytime you want to be excused, it's, it's not the dinner table. You could just say goodnight, y'all. and You don't need our permission. Thank you. Thank you, Aiden. Have a good night. Okay, the next items, discussion action items. These are important items uh, that we're going to pay attention to tonight. The first one is the approval of Mr. Eric Osborne's Assistant Superintendent Personnel Employment Agreement through June 30th, 2026. It's recommended the Board of Education on behalf of GUSD enter into this employment agreement with Mr. Osborne and Mr. DeGra our superintendent DeGrazia is going to explain those variables to us. I have to make a motion, a motion first. first. Make a motion first? Yeah. Okay. You need a motion and a second, and then you can have discussion. Okay, go right ahead. I make a motion. I'll, I'll second. second. So we have a motion and a second. Now let's have some discussion. Thank you so much, and it's my pleasure to bring this forward for Mr. Osborne and also for Dr. Prince and for Mrs. Walzak. So I don't know if you want to amend the motion to consider all three at the same time or not. I would like to do that for sure. I just thought that he presented them to us, then we made a motion, and then we had discussion. You have to have a motion first. I'll make a motion okay. for item 6.1, 6.2, and 6.3. So you're amending the first motion amending to the include the motion. other two? Thank you so much. I'll second it. There we go. Thank you so much. Much appreciation. Uh, the, and the reason I asked to do that is the three contracts are nearly identical. There's actually no change in the salary placement for Dr. Prince and Mr. Osborne, and only a slight change in the increase for Ms. Walzak due to her new position. So we're excited about that. The language is nearly identical. 
and all three, a little exception for Ms. Walzak because she's a PERS member and not a STIRS member. And just as a point of clarification, this updated contract for Dr. Prince and Mr. Osborne will retroact their current salary back to July 1st. That's correct. When their contract started, Mrs. Walzak's new salary will be effective. That's correct. Ju today uh, December, or last December, December 12th th after okay. their approval. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly correct. We used uh, comparable districts to look at salaries and salary schedule, which comes up later in the consent item. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I want to uh, just add to the discussion. Thank you for your patience, yes. for your professionalism, and for all of that, those leadership attributes that you displayed during this time. Because I know we started talking about this. We've been here a year, so this has been on the agenda for, what, six months or on the topic of discussion. And um, I appreciate you guys keeping your nose to the grindstone, moving forward, knowing that this was going to come to this time. So I'm uh, anxious to support it. I think it gets us where we need to go moving forward with this new team that we have formed. And uh, I'm very pleased with the trioka that uh, our superintendent has assembled. Yeah. It's a, 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 it's all right, well, that's good. That's six, one, two, and three. Thank you for that. That moves us to the consent items where the Board of Education can consider agenda consent items as a whole or as individuals. Any item can be removed by any member of the board for discussion and possible action. And this considers item seven, one, all the way through item 11, four. Seven, one through 11, four. So are there any board members who want to pull any items from 7-1 through 11-4? I do have a couple in the Ed Services consent items that I'd like to pull, so... What are those numbers, please? Um, 9.2, uh, 9.5, 9.6, One second. It's okay. But definitely 9.2 and 9.5. Does anybody else have any other ones? No, take your time. Um, I'm going to throw 9.7 in for good measure. Okay. Then we have 7, 1 through 11, 4. Stay 9, 2, 9, 5, and 9, 7. May I have a motion, please? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposition? Okay. Thank you for that. Item 9-2. I'll make a motion. You want to discuss it first? No, you got to make the motion and second it and then discuss it. Okay. Well, we might disagree with that, but it's okay. okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I made the motion. I'll second it. Thank you very much. All right. Discuss away. Okay. Um, I do want to, so this is item 9.2, our, our school ap accountability report cards. And um, oh, how do I be concise about this? So our school ap accountability report cards, every school does them every year. And then behind them as sort of a supplemental um, data point are the FITs. What does FIT stand for? Facility inspection tool. Okay, thanks. So um, I'm going to, as for an example, pull up the Goddard Sark. I'm sorry, you guys are just going to have to bear with me here for one second. And these are specific, mine are, are my questions are specific to facilities. 
And I know Mr. Parad is here. Um, and so really, for, 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 for the first, first point I'd like to make, these are the most um, detailed and comprehensive SARC reports I've ever seen. Yeah, thank you. For so that. thank you very much. And so what I have a hard time with, and I understand it conceptually, but I'd like for you to sort of maybe expand on it or make sure that we're all on the same page. But for example, on the Goddard Sark, the system inspected for the gas leaks mechanical HVAC and sewer, it was rated good. And then so I went to the FIT report and saw what comprised of a good score on FIT. Now everybody that's in this room knows that the Goddard HVAC system is not good. <laughs> and so what I have a hard time with is that we're gonna approve these reports based on the criteria that are presented in these FITs and SARCs. But how do we then, and this is sort of an ideological, you know, conceptual conversation, is there a way that you can not rate it good or rate it poor based on the criteria that are in the fit so that we can do something about it to make it a little bit easier for us to argue when it comes to the budget that you need to actually make it good? So, as you said, this is, this is more detailed this year. Um, Way more. In my old district, kind of probably what Tommy did as well. Uh, we don't want to dink our districts. We don't want to make our districts look bad. We're going to just put what we think needs to be done. Anything small, work order, we'll take care of it. So it doesn't have to necessarily go in the report. So this being my first year, I put everything. Um, and as thorough as I could be, I still missed stuff. Um, grading the HVAC, I don't grade each room individually. You know, room one, HVAC room. Um, unless I know that they are already, there's a work order, there's a deficiency. Because it's either... It's either good or a deficiency. It's kind of, it's either one or the other. And then as you, as you rate them as a whole, that's how you get the, the grade of excellent, good, mm -hmm. poor, fair. Mm -hmm. um, so rating the chiller, um, it's not necessarily, it's, it's a whole. I would have to rate each room individually and in a percentage, mm -hmm. percentage is still good because. So you're only, limited by the report as far as. Yeah. So 30 classrooms and, and one chiller, one dink, the overall percentage is still going to be good. good. Yeah. And the, the fit report in the SARC is not tied to financial. Yeah, that's another Well, maybe thing. So, it should so, be. So we, that's another thing we, we, we thought, well, people think, hey, if we, if we show that we need help, we're going to get funding. Yeah. It, it doesn't trigger that. So when you say the ding, I get it. What would a ding do? Uh, just, <laughs> it just, uh, it just brings down the, bring down the score. And then what? So what? We bring down the score. So what? Well, as an overall rating, so we can be poor in one area. Okay. Um, but there's what, nine areas. What does that mean, Dr. Nahara? In fact, our Williams reports, we don't want um, your different ratings on the Williams reports. Um, the, the public wants to hear this. I'm positive. Um, when, you, when we look at our Williams reports, it's um, facilities, access to textbooks, um, all of the stuff, so to speak. So funding is seen. tied to that? What? Funding is no. tied? Oh. Um, ratings are si tied to that, and then improvement plans. What does ratings like mean? Well, if you have a poor um, Williams report, uh -huh. you, you're then put in different tiers, and then there's things that you will need to continue to do and report on. Deficient would be there is none. Think about it that way. A deficient report would say that it's in disarray and there is none. There is something. It's not what we like. It doesn't run exactly the way we want, but it's there. Mm -hmm. So deficient would be there is no um, H, uh, any, any system cooling the classrooms at all or deficient in um, the bathrooms are in disrepair and uh -huh. disarray. That all goes back into your Williams um, report. So it's But not, then what? And then what? Yeah, like you just are going to have to fill out more reports. To whom? To whom? 
Laco, the, who? The county and the state will come in if you become a Williams, um, I think it's a, I don't want to quote, misquote myself. A deviant but, of Williams. Okay, not Williams School, but no. a Williams uh -huh. report. Um, I mean, if you continue to have poor ratings on those, state can come in and say, we're going to have to take over schools. Uh huh. And, that, and, and for that, we don't want, that's not the area, and that doesn't represent who Glendor is, what Glendor is, and what we can provide. Listen, for our I students. don't want to, and that's why I wanted yeah. to start this when I when I brought my friend mm -hmm. Mr. Prada up if, to the. If I, could, if I could give an example, so, yeah. So in my old district, we had Williams School. Okay. I mean, because we. Were, oh, they were on the naughty they list. Were on the naughty list. <laughs> okay. So they're they're on the naughty list for three years. Okay. And that's usually due to not facilities. Okay. <laughs> Okay. But, it, but it's a Test whole. And Whatever. So, so okay. We are we are together. We are a whole. Yeah. So if we're if we're below oh. if below our rating, oh. we both get we both get it. Oh. Um. So, but, in Laco's world, we're all Williams schools, even yeah. though we're not in the poor rating. Okay. We're all considered rating uh, Williams. That's why we we perform mm -hmm. these these uh, fit inspections and the SARC report, um, because we have to. Um, but, but I mean, they don't do anything call. for us. Yeah, but they, we got to call it like it is, too. I mean, can I add to your question? Well, or? yes, but I think that if you read the fit, which is what I was really trying to drill down to, the questions that they asked, he answered honestly mm -hmm. and correctly in those questions. It's just the wrong question. So I have a question. <laughs> the right one or the wrong one? I hope it's the right one. So in the, in the SARC for Sandberg, which we know the HVAC system doesn't work. Can I get a name? No, in? it works. Okay. No, it works. See, well, it's, work. it works, but it works. not efficiently. It works today. <laughs> it works today. <laughs> so, <laughs> under repairs needed and action taken or planned, we it's not even listed in there as um, repair needed. It's fine that it says rated. You rated it good, but why can't we make a note that it needs to be repaired, at the very minimum? Well, it's kind of like. The day I did the inspection, it worked. Yeah. It's a point. Okay, I didn't have any rain leaks. I didn't have no ceiling tiles stained. So can you come back when Today it's Today it rained. <laughs> I have visible stained ceiling tiles, which means I got a leak somewhere. Which... Okay, that's a fair so, so it's just in that moment in time. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's, it's, so some, we used to just conduct, I mean, we can conduct the inspection anytime throughout the year. Mm. Um, if we did it in the summer, I don't think summer. that's a fair assessment because I want the student, uh, the, the, the school to actually be in session to where Fair. the rooms are being used um, and getting a little bit destroyed or, you know, rain leaks or, and then I do it at the end of the year because that's when it's, it's due. So it's kind of like, it's, it's like hand in hand, like inspection's done, it gets reported. But can you see where our Sandberg teachers will look at this and say, what do you mean our HVAC is good? Like, why isn't the HVAC well, see, again, even listed here? We go here? back to, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't do anything to, but it's yeah. action items for us as well, right? It's a, it's a, yeah, so, it's a list of things that need to so, be repaired. So when I do my inspection, I'll, again, I'll touch every room and I'll write it down. I, I type it out and I send that to the principal. And then I give it to Dana, my secretary, and she, and she inputs it mm -hmm. through LACO, which, which goes to um, uh, Dr. Navarro. It's on. Um, so... The, 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 the principals get the report, and again, they'll be plug-in air freshener, mm -hmm. um, which is, which is, which is, a, which is a, de a deficiency on our report. Um, and then I'll get work order, stained ceiling tile. So we accumulate those, and we take care of them. We're supposed to take care of them throughout the year until we go back to next year again. Um, and it's, it's a reminder of, hey, don't do this again. Don't so do plug in that a, air freshener again. Do you get a work order to remove the Plug-in air freshener? No, no, no. So I'll, anything, I'll even label it. Site responsibility, maintenance responsibility. Mm -hmm. so, because I think everyone should know, because we've had an issue with parents coming to the board about plug-in air fresheners. <laughs> so I'm just, seriously. So that's where, where I, I help develop my own work orders. Um, so this is a punch list of things that need to be, like a honeydew list, right? we got to get through these. Yeah, now, if we were, if we were again, a Lake School, a Williams School, Lake would come and visit us. Um, <laughs> would they do the work? <laughs> no, and they will, they, will, they, will, they will knock us on. Will they say do it or else? 
Well, they gave us uh, either a recheck or but we'll see you next year. Or they won't even bother because it's it's so low on the on the repair. Right. Right. Yeah. So when you have this punch list now, some of it is site responsibility, yes. simple things like fix the cord, whatever, disconnect the, and whatever is yours. How long do you have to take care of that punch list? One year see, until well, we have the Sark again. I'll be doing the inspection next year, so. So you got to be done as long by next as it's not year. On the inspection for next year. And then, do you prioritize them by order of like the most important? Like you have a leaky tile um, or something. Yeah, I mean, uh, and then based on the trade as well. Like I've already started my plumber on one on three of the schools already. So he's more available to as he's there, he can start on some of the work. Some of them I can't get into classroom until we have a break. Um, I, I don't want to discourage you from being so thorough. I think it is incredibly important that you are as thorough as you were this time every single year. I, I don't want it to be like, this is important. It, if we don't know what is wrong, how are we ever going to fix it or take care of it? Well, right? that's, and our, that's our teachers why. know, our students know, they're in there, they're looking at these tiles every day, they see brown spots, they, they know what's wrong. So we don't get to go to every single classroom and inspect it in this way that you have. So well, and believe important. it or not, people don't report it. Um, yeah. I've come across stuff and I'm like, oh my God, like, why hasn't anybody reported this? Well, and I want to make clear that um, this line of questioning, I think I can speak for the group, is not to, um, we're, we're not frustrated with the, with, with the maintenance team. We're not, n no problem with that at all. We're trying to figure out a way to help you to be able to figure out how if any of this can be tied to any sort of funding or if we reach a certain point that we can actually show somebody something, right? Like we're trying to work with the state for funding for those HVAC units, right? And if we had reports that said that they were poor or whatever the case might be, it's just sort of one more... Um, uh, thing in our arsenal as we try and work with our legislators to try and get more funds. So that's really where I think this whole line of questioning is coming from. Well, Not to question anybody's actual work or what's going on. It's how can we help so you? You'll, you'll see on there too, uh, gas leaks, sewer, like there's stuff I can. I don't, I don't, I don't check for gas leaks. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the obvious or something that's pending. Um, I may not check every single playground piece of equipment, um, every piece of asphalt, um, every, you know, I'll do general, general, general. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of dollars out there that need to be spent on repairs, uh, I mean, big, yeah. re big repairs. Yeah, you know, again, I, I really do want to thank you for your um, extreme thoroughness in these reports. It really does help us better understand what the day-to-day -day looks like. I just wish that the system was set up that these reports could be helpful to a district and not just put you in a Williams non-compliance issue. Yeah. You know, that doesn't lead to anything, doesn't this, lead us anywhere. This, this particular report, that's not the intention. The FIT report to go into the SARC is really just a, the SARC is the school accountability report card. How are we graded? And based on those criteria, that's what it is. So, so explain to me the Sutherland School SARC and when you inspected the snack bar and the bathroom and the blighted area there. I, I don't even that's see. That's not on there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I see didn't. under school facility conditions and planned improvements. That's an area that or I do, do we just I didn't tell me that. about that? Well, that's an area I didn't include. Um, it's not being used. Um, I know it's in disarray. I poked my head in there, and um, I just, yeah, it doesn't, like I said, not everything gets put on there. I can't. I, I mean, I do the inspections personally myself. So, uh, no, I, so, I'm not, and again, it's not, uh, I'm just telling you that as a, as a board of trustees and a governing body person, I believe that that property is part of Sutherland School. If I'm wrong, tell me. Well, it is. It's, and, it, I mean, you're right. I but just, I never, it's, it's, I, I don't like the way it looks. So I, my argument there would be if that had to be a school that was on a report to get it fixed, I would vote to get it on the report. But, it just doesn't get it fixed. Yeah, and it's though. not an area that's being used. Um, okay. I, 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 I'm with I'm you. Just, I'm I just saying when I read the you. report. But what I'm hearing from them now is if we did that, 
if we if we sent Mr. Prada over there on the worst day so that they would fail all of these things, right? No, I'm not forget that statement. I just you don't have it to doesn't work. It doesn't anything. help. Well then every school would, would, would be deficient because we, we would get funded. <laughs> right. If we knew we got funded and we put everything on right. I guess that's it. Yeah. That's it. They figured out my game. I, I just I had two specific <laughs> questions. I didn't see the the rest of Sutherland School on here, and then I don't see Williams on it. So, Williams. is tell you now you're going to tell me Williams doesn't count, but it counts for the L cap, and it I'm going to blow Williams up the does gasket. Not, doesn't have um, a SARC. As, and as why well. doesn't it have a SARC? We're not. It's um, not a school that's serving our K through 12 population. During the school day, okay. academically with with courses and classes, um, that it's for the SARC. So Williams has other things happening, but one of the requirements for Williams is not the SARC. But I did do the inspection. <laughs> and wait, do you have See, a fit I, report? It's in the. I just folder. want you to know that I have a fundamental issue with spending LCAP money. I, I just it, it doesn't make sense to me. If it, I mean, if it has to do with learning outcomes and it's a necessary thing in our district then let's include it. LCAP is not funding. So maybe that's a piece that I could clear up. LCAP is the local control accountability plan, which is tied. One piece that it's tied to is our local control funding formula, which is the fun, the funds. The LCAP also encompasses when we have goals and actions, other budget sources. So LCAP is not a funding source. LCAP is a plan to that lead to creates student goals outcomes. and actions. Right, but it leads yeah. to student outcomes, right? That's the, 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 the sum of that LCAP product is improving student outcomes, I believe. Um, the, so the sum of the LCAP plan is once you have your goals uh, um, established, which we have goals in a variety of areas, right. student outcomes and student achievement is one of those, safety is one of those, fiscal solvency is one of those, community engagement is one of those. So it, the, the um, end all um, objective of the, L, the LCAP plan is to say, how are we, what goals are we gonna do and what actions are tied to those goals and then we're, then it's an accountability piece for the funding source. It's very similar to the school plans that the schools have where they have their data, they set their goals, they give you their metric and their funding source. So that the LCAP is the district's plan. Got it. Does that help a little? I it helps. Know. I understand the words. That right. I understand the, the words that you understand. You understand. Okay. I just, I, I, I still don't get the nexus. It, and maybe it's just me, but it, it annoys me that we have these properties that I believe are not in the like. You know, I think my statement on the record is I want all of our properties to look like Disneyland. I think I've said that before, and I, I don't see any focus on that. And I'm, and I, I, I want focus on it. I want it to get better. Um, I want us to spend our precious resources on particular properties that we need um, to, to, to help with our learning outcomes and those four goals. Um, I don't see it here in this particular SARC or FIT. And I don't, I, I don't understand the SARC process well enough, I guess, then to even vote on whether what the efficacy or accuracy of these are as it relates to the, the the betterment of our school, or is it just a drill that you have to do it, to check a box to sit? And and, and yes. then why do you need a vote? It is for a me requirement that? that we is do a SARC, a school accountability oh, report card, yeah. for each one of our schools, which um, then is really a document that can be found then for anybody to look at on the California Department of Education webpage. So you could go on the CDE right now, you could look at the 2223, you could search any school in California and they have to provide a SARC. Um, so that it is just one of those requirements. Most of the data in the SARC is pre-populated by the California Department of Education. What it does is it takes all of that testing data, which I shared with you today, um, and then additional school site uh, specific data like 
what are their what are their goals and missions how active is their pta you know what what uh, programs might they have and then it takes facilities and what the purpose of the SARC is it puts it all in one place for public consumption and public view and it's a requirement so that anybody could um, go on and see so for example if i were to be applying for a job um, say as principal of, oh, I don't know, Stanton Elementary, just say, right? Before I would apply for that job, the first thing I would do would be to pull up that school SARC and read it and know it because I would know their test scores, I would know their staffing, I would know their programs, I would know their teachers, I would know their class sizes. It is a one-stop shop to get a broad bird's eye view with particular data points about every school in our district. I understand what you're saying, but let me tell you what I'm understanding. Okay, I look at the report and just like you said, I want to teach at Sutherland, so I go to it. And there's three bullet points. Degree to which teachers are appropriately assigned and fully credentialed in the subject area, just like you said, right? Second one, pupils have access to standard-aligned instructional materials. Third one, this is the one I struggle with. School facilities are maintained in good repair. I, I don't agree with that statement. I mean, personally, as one of, in that particular facility, I don't... I don't, I don't agree with that, but you're, you're telling me that it is. It's basically with this report, you're telling me that it is, right? All of the, what he enters goes into a um, web-based program through LACO. We don't write the repair. We, I mean, no, no, I, I understand we don't write the that. rating, so it's the criterion based on the program. So your criterion in good and LACO's assessment of good happen to be different. You, you then I'll, I'll invite Laco over to use the restroom <laughs> yeah. over there so, and that's the best see way how that works out so for him. I don't. It, it, Southern is good. It's not excellent. There's, there's an excellent. Right. Their good is basic and functional. Is really what it is. Question. Um, so since this is kind of uh, just a report that has to be made and available for public to access, do is it is there anywhere that says that we have to complete these items? that yeah. we said if are in need of accountability to the items it's on the list really so there's no, no... So again, we're not on that list so there's no local police that well, come down okay we have a board police just kidding <laughs> <laughs> but, but again but again but, yeah, but you know but we're all learning it, what so... i could have wrote was nothing, nothing wrong yeah. no and i appreciate you being honest because um, it's good to know and, it's, and it's if important. i know you guys should were, be honest if i knew the board police was going to come See that I, oh, come on. <laughs> if I if I was gonna do all the work, then I say, oh my God, I'm giving myself too much work. So, but no, that was kind of a. It, it is an introductory for me for them to say. You know, we have a lot of extension cords connected to power strips. We can't do that. that that's what it says. Let's let's do better. Thank you, Mr. Parada. Thank you. As far as voting, this actually needs to be filed by February 1st. So I don't know if that it isn't that it's an option to not vote. No, I guess I mean, it is. We'll have a motion. Uh, yes, we'll make you're right. We'll see where it goes. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. aye. And I have one opposition. So it passes. Okay. Okay, what was the next one I pulled? The next one you have is 9 5. Okay. All right, I'll make a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Let's talk about it. So essentially what this is saying is that we approved $150,000 for autism-related therapy on July 24, 2023, and that the um, needs are greater than what we approved by 100%. And I would just like a little bit more information on that, please. So Dr. Murray is not here, but as a pinch hitter, um, both of these items that were pulled, uh, a lot of times throughout the year, you, students have annual IEPs. So they may have where they, um, it's a student who didn't have services and now does need those services and they weren't in the original amount. Or it could be a student who did have and now they need more of those services. Um, or a student who moves in with an IEP and we add those services. So this is really based on the, the original figures we did based on the information we had at the time. As we're progressing throughout the year, more need, means we don't have those supports here in district, so we have to do more with that. Where do we get the additional money? 
Dr. Santi Mira. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Negrossi. So this one, according to the budget source, is IDEA funds, which is a special education fund. So we had left some portion of that IDEA money not accounted for for circumstances such as this. Correct. Okay. So s a simpler version is it's within the budget? That's right. That's, well, I need, that's what I need to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, Mr. President, within the budget. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposition? All right, our last one is 9.7, and you said it was the same thing. Yeah, so the reason for the addition, um, and this is not a 100% addition, the reason for the addition was the same thing. More students are requiring the services than were originally anticipated, whether that's through new students getting an IEP or through the IEP process adding services. Mr. President, um, sorry to interrupt, but we do need a motion before yeah. we... Oh, a motion. There you go. May I have a motion? I slept on that job. Yes. I slept on it. Do I have a motion? Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Discuss away. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, pretend we didn't yeah, talk no, about I that before. I, we've okay. got the gist of it. My um, question is this. Yes. Could you need to come back to us again this fiscal year? We hope not, but with special education, you never say never because those IEPs are continuing. It's not like everybody has an IEP at the very beginning of the school year. They have an IEP on their anniversary date with their IEP right. or as called as needed. Um, there's a possibility, but we, we hope not. Do you feel like we had, we were, Jeanette do you, or Mrs. Walzak, do you feel like we were um, too, I mean, like, we have plenty of money, yes? Did we budget, do you feel like we budgeted correctly, I guess, is the way that I'm wondering right now. Yeah, so we did budget, so there's funds um, that's budgeted for certain things. However, for this particular purchase order for, uh, set aside for this vendor, they only set aside um, for the, uh, the purchase order $150,000. However, when we receive funding like let's say IDEA, what we do is we budget those um, with you know different resources, whether contracted services, materials and supplies and whatnot. Um, so they're budgeted for because thinking, okay, we might be those funds are going to be used up f with w w one contractor or the other, but um, but we don't necessarily always in the beginning of the the school year budget the entire amount or say allocate it okay. by vendor. And IDEA doesn't is unrestricted inside special education. Correct. Okay. Okay. What does IDEA stand for? Individual, individual, the Disabilities Education Act. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I've, I just, when I read the, uh, the current considerations, I even have more questions now because it says we, it says on June 12, 2023, we approved 30,000. And then it says on July 24th, 2023, we approved additional funds for 60,000. And then it says additional funds for 50,000 to provide services for additional students per their IEPs. So either new students with new IEPs or So we're it's IEPs. it's a it's 50,000 not 150. Correct. No, she said 150 though. I was wondering what Okay. Yeah, the, the current one, that one we had already done, so the one we're currently on is the, it was originally 60000 We're adding 30000 for more services to make a total of 90000 for this particular service provider. So we're on, no, 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 are we on the other one? No. Oh. Yeah, the so 150 I'm, I'm just I had them flipped. all the different things. So 9-7 talks about the numbers I just said. It was originally 30, mm -hmm. then we approved 60, so that's 90. And now we're asking for 50 more, so that's 140 total. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And, and all and of that says, would have been budgeted for, but not allocated. Yeah, it's budgeted for, but it's, it's budgeted for, but not allocated. So 
So we're not overspending. No, no it said yeah, it says yes on the on the budget part. So I think we're good. We're just taking it out of that reserve fund and moving it into an expenditure. It's kind of okay. Like, all those in favor? It's kind of like PTA Oops. when funds have to be released before you can pay the bill. Fair enough. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposition? There is not. So that handles the entire consent calendar. <laughs> so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned for the evening at 1020. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a beautiful audience. Hey. hey.